Are you struggling with doubts at home? Have you been coming across too many Christian apologist videos? If you have, I have some recommendations for you. First thing you need to do is focus purely, and I say purely, on atheistic content. We want you to be strong in your atheism. Stop watching Christian apologists. Stop watching William Lane Craig and all of the Christians out there. Because you're not strong in your atheism first. So you need to have a strong skeptical foundation before you consider going out and getting in the boxing match with these Christian apologists who have their arguments ready to knock you out. I'm telling you, you need to strengthen your atheist for atheism first, okay? Actually, uh, I'm just being sarcastic because there was a video response uh, by Testify, a guy named Eric Manning. I consider him a friend. He's a Christian apologist, even though I totally disagree on the video that he did at the end of the day. Unless my motivating factor was for my particular understanding of Christianity, and I'm really wanting Christians not to fall away because I have a worldview that kind of has an, probably a bad ending for people who aren't going to stay Christian, or if they don't believe, there could be some type of repercussion at the end of the day. Um, at the end of the day, I think that we, we had a conversation yesterday. I was getting on my plane back from Boston after interviewing Paula Fredrickson. Uh, what a heck of a trip. I didn't get in until really late last night. But we talked a little, and of course, um, he's been making little pictures and stuff like that on fate on YouTube. Let me pull up his YouTube channel. I'll actually, give him a plug. It is the video is in the description for those who are interested in checking it out. So his YouTube channel is Testify. He's a Christian apologist, and he did a video um, on "Are you a Christian with doubts? Stop doing this. Stop it. Okay, turn them off. Can you all see this video?" I don't want to click it because then it takes the thumbnail away. But in the thumbnail, there's a picture of like rationality rules, Richard Carrier, um, who, who else is there? Uh, Holy Kool-Aid, uh, genetically modified skeptic, I think cosmic skeptic, Apologia, me, and I don't know, a couple other people, Matt Dillahunty. I can't make out all of them, but... You know, my picture made it on the thumbnail. So I said, you know, maybe I should respond because... Many of these channels are doing multiple things, just like my channel is doing multiple things. And this is the video that is in the description. We're going to review this in just a moment. I'm going to give you my thoughts. Then I have a special treat for you. I want to have Eric join me to have the conversation about this at the end of this episode. Um, and hopefully his internet's working well so we can actually have that talk. So what's up, everybody in the chat? Good to see you all here. Uh, hello, JS, Steve, Alan. Oh, ho, 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 ho. Paula Gia, that heretic you shouldn't watch anymore. Paula Gia. Uh, Jasper, I see where you're going with this. I'm glad you are. What's up, Mojo? See, Steve, uh, I'm just checking on everybody here saying, hey, welcome in the chat. Testify is here. Oh, Tovia Singer's in that? Hold on, dude. Oh, he's covered up by the T and the them. I can't even see who was down there. All right, so so the list can go on, actually. You could probably put 50 more people who are skeptics, who have channels that are making content. A lot of it is atheistic or skeptical content, taking jabs at Christianity. But I want to do something that I hope is a little different and even testify sees it as like a curveball. Because when we say Christianity... When he says you need to first understand Christianity, my real, honest, sincere, I'm not being sarcastic. I mean this with all sincerity. I mean, I pulled just a couple books off the shelf just to get people to like consider really looking the first New Testament, Marcion scriptural canon. And by the way, this is not like some fringe crazy. This is scholarship where, um, you know, E.P. Sanders and Bart Ehrman and other people are on the back going, hey, this is good. This is good stuff to contend with. Resurrection and Paul, right? My channel is like, well, let me just show you. Let me just show you guys before we start reviewing the video so that I can actually respond piece by piece to what I think. And I just want people to get a taste. Like when I go to send emails out, right, to do interviews, 
This is the list I use. And by the way, I've done many multiple interviews with a lot of these same academics. So it's not like I'm just this skeptic on the internet who just like throws, you know, mud at the wall or spaghetti at the wall and hopes it sticks. I'm interviewing professors, PhDs, experts in the field with various conclusions. And if there's one thing that I'm confident of is Christianity was not this single message. And the New Testament is not a single message with one narrative telling you, here it is. This is what it all is. It's just believe what we're saying. We have one package deal and it's called Christianity and you need to buy it. And by the way, we're in line with Justin Martyr and Tertullian and Irenaeus and Eusebius and uh, Athanasius. And the list goes on and on. And all you got to do is just follow the Orthodox Church and you figured out Christianity. Therefore, you have it. In fact, I want to rip the rug out from underneath what we mean by you need to understand Christianity first before we even watch this video to point out when I say studying Christianity and why you should watch channels like mine is because when you see the academics and it's not just coming from McGrews or a Christian apologist or Mike Lacona who might have a minimalist approach, uh, at least a minimalist resurrection approach or whatnot, you're going to find out the wild, wild west in the New Testament. There are people with different views of the Christology. There are various gospels that seem to be going out. And when you look at the scholarship on the gospels, that's another thing. So my recommendation up front, and this is coming from an atheist, right? The other side, watch everyone. Watch them and the skeptics. Watch it all. And if you're a doubter, who's struggling in your faith, the only reason I would take the recommendation that's coming from our friend here, Eric, is you don't want to fall away because you're afraid of the repercussions or in some way you're in that group that you feel like, I don't want to be ostracized or I'm going to lose my salvation. There seems to be some way in, in trying to keep you in that bubble. The atheist is already in hot water according to Christianity or versions of Christianity that at least posit an eternal conscious torment or some type of post-mortem suffering or something to that effect. So my recommendation is your entire epistemological approach is I want the truth. And what does the scripture say? The truth shall set you free and free indeed. And I'm telling you, if you're seeking the truth, you really want to understand what the facts are you dive into this material, study all of it. If you get yourself in a bubble, a, a tribe, get yourself indoctrinated into a particular tribe, okay? Then you have kind of a tribalism mentality on when a skeptic's talking or even a non-skeptic. I have Christian academics who say loaded with contradictions. The gospels don't agree. They're rewriting earlier gospels for their own agendas. Acts contradicts Paul, which I know Eric disagrees with. Go listen to the arguments that Eric brings up for it. Go listen to the Christian apologist. Then check out all the scholars that I bring out over here. But it's really a matter of, in my opinion, get yourself rooted in this belief before you end up going and listening to people who are going to challenge that. And I've had people on my Patreon write me, I still got to make a conversation happen with them because they're doubting and they're struggling. And in fact, they've been watching Testify and Caleb Jackson and Christian Apologist. And they're like, he's bringing up these really interesting points. What do I do? Well, I mean, keep studying, keep reading, keep researching, don't stop, keep going. But in some way, shape or form, he's being swayed. And my advice is keep being critical. Keep studying, keep examining this material, listen to all sides, because if you don't, you might end up buying something that feels good to you. Here we go with that Holy Ghost experience that William Lane Craig talks about. The story, the message was just so good that if there was one in a million chance that this could be true, which I know Eric doesn't agree with this conclusion, but there's one in a million chance that this could be true, I had to buy it. As Paulogia says, he lowered the bar to the floor and he bought into it. Now, once you buy into it and you have attached emotional baggage to this, which is exactly what Nathan and uh, Pine Creek were talking about right before I went live over on Nathan's channel, Digital Gnosis, then there's this struggle of like, 
I'm attached to this. And trying to break free of that is very difficult. In fact, Christians who are doubting are experiencing that process. I did. I know Paula Gia did. I'm fairly confident many of the ex-Christians that you talk to have gone through this process. And so anyways, I want to say hey to everybody in the chat. I hope you're doing well. Good to see that um, Paula Gia is here. <laughs> Especially avoid apology. <laughs> By the way, uh, Eric and uh, me talked yesterday on the phone. I was asking if Paul wanted to come on at some point for this review because, uh, you know, his name, his face showed up. I like to have Paul on and he's a good guy. Um, well, he's a wretched sinner, depending on which worldview you take. He's a wretched, wicked, absolute wretch, uh, you know, <laughs> His righteousness is worse than filthy rags, okay? Like, but but to me, he's an amazing, awesome individual uh, who deserves your attention. All right, let's 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 share the screen. Let's go to Chrome tab. Here we are. Let me get this video up. Okay, so um, Eric Manning is on the screen, and the video he did, which had me on the thumbnail... Are you a Christian with doubts? Stop doing this. So we're going to have some fun here. And I'll try and pause it periodically to give you my two cents. Okay, hold on. Two, two on one myth vision. No, actually, I was going to see if Caleb wanted to join too. But he can't join. And, and I'm not trying to make this a debate. These are conversations. But I do think it's important to point out like where we're both coming from and explaining why we're coming from those perceptions. Now... I wanted to do it at 1.25. Can we can we play this thing at 1.25, my friends? Can you handle just a little faster than normal? Let me know in the chat before I hit play. I'm waiting for you. Give me some give me some yes. Well, I, I don't think his internet works uh, good right now. He's he's concerned about that. All right, you can handle 1.25. We got somebody who can handle the 1.25 speed. Jasper said, okay, okay. I, I, I might trigger some people if I put you up to Shapiro speed. So not interested in doing that. Uh, okay, we're good. Let's do it. Hey, you, anxious Christian dude. Yeah, you, the guy with the doubts. Stop listening to atheist YouTubers. It's time to stop. Turn off rationality rules, turn off holy Kool-Aid, turn off genetically modified skeptic, and turn off Matt Dillahoney. Listen, I know you want to mitigate against your biases by listening to the other side. I know that sounds like a wise thing to do, but you're actually being stupid. Hear me out. I've been doing apologetics ministry for a while now, and one common mistake I see from Christians struggling with their faith is that they try and prematurely flex their apologetic muscles by spending time. I, I need to mention, so I want to pick this apart as we go. I think this is very important. Um, Eric has stronger muscles than this guy. That's number one. Okay, that's what he's trying to claim. No, on a serious note, um, it seems that, you know, He's talking to doubting Christians who might be trying to challenge atheists that are like out there trying to debate or something, and they need to get their muscles up. That's how I'm trying to understand this piece by piece, because I've been seeing Eric's post, and, he, and he's getting these uh, atheists in the chat, and it's like in the conversations that have gone back and forth after I've read some of them, it's like Eric's like, you're not understanding me. And the atheists are understanding this to kind of sound like, first come to me, and I get why. I mean, this is how it appears. First come to me or to our understanding of Christianity, get your strength up on understanding Christianity as we know it to be, because it's true. You know, we believe it. It's true. We have a, a strong case for Christianity. Their particular case is a maximalist view, which is different than the minimal resurrection view. So Paula G has done an interview with him in the past where they actually discussed this version but it comes back to, as Paul Gia says, and I think there may be some validity to this, where minimalists are going, well, this right here, I wouldn't take to the bank. Um, I'm not so sure this happened, but I'm confident that this happened pertaining to the resurrection. The disciples saw something. They experienced something, or Paul experienced and saw something and claims others did so as well, taking a very minimal approach. Whereas the maximalist approach I think Paul would say is practically saying this. So if like the text of the Bible is saying it, 
it, it pretty much is right, or it's close to uh, the mark. Now, correct me if I'm wrong here when you get on here, Eric. Um, is it that the Bible says it, therefore it's true? I don't know. We, we need to talk about this. Um, but a lot of the academics that I have on are like, no, no. Luke seems to not know Paul and contradicts Paul. Or uh, Mark is being used by these other gospels, and they're rewriting it. And they're doing things that literally disagree with Mark on many points. There's like a competition on who's writing the best gospel and getting an accurate understanding of who Jesus is. I got a bunch of books I was going to pull off my shelf about Jesus, but we like we can't even really be talking about Christianity and our understanding of it without at least wrestling with the issue of which Jesus and how do we understand exactly who that is? Is it because the Bible tells me so? And this is the perception we just agree with what the Bible says about and it's true or not? I don't know. Um, anywho, uh, I'm going to continue here. I'm just trying to comment along the way. Let me know if there's anything you want me to emphasize. Listening to tons of atheist YouTubers, but they don't get the bulk of Christian evidences strong under their belt first. So when they come across a few things that stump them, they get troubled, anxious, or even set aside their faith altogether. This is falling prey to what the great English logician Richard Whateley called the fallacy of objections. Whateley defined the fallacy of objections as showing that there are objections against some plan, theory, or system, and thence inferring that it should be rejected when that which ought to have been proved is that there are more or stronger objections against the receiving than the rejecting of it. Again, I understand that you want to mitigate your biases by listening to the other side. However, until you yourself can articulate a robust case for Christianity, I don't recommend that you do that. And this is what I would, I would want to undermine the whole Christianity. What Christianity? Whose version? That's why I do what I do on my channel. It actually tells us, like, hold up. There's not like a single, we got the version of Christianity. Now, if the case that you're trying to make, Eric, is, well, we just believe that the text talks about Jesus rose from the dead and others claimed he rose from the dead. I think Christianity entails a lot more than just a guy rose from the dead and people experienced it after he died. It includes atonement. It includes various texts of the New Testament, if not all of them, to try and draw this picture of what Christianity ends up becoming. But a lot of the scholars I talk to are like, what do you mean a version of Christianity? Like that there are many versions, even in the New Testament, there's already various breakoffs and ideas of what it means to be in Christ. Paul says those who are circumcising, right? Those, those uh, Judaizers, right? Are literally making Christ's crucifixion null and void. And that they're like, you're not even going to have salvation if you start doing the things he's saying in Galatians. So there are other Christians who are actually teaching these ideas. And is it, well, we found a formulation of Christianity that we believe is true. If you don't have our version and you don't solidify in that, you're wasting your time. I think what's doubting a lot of, Christ a lot of Christians who are leaving Christianity and what's causing that doubt, if you will, is discovering the mess that we have and how these texts in the ancient times that they were written, like how reliable are these where we're going to put, as Kyle wrote to Craig, our entire life and everything into it and have this epistemic bar that really is written in this literature that's already kind of, mm, can I absolutely trust this literature? Now, when you come on, I'm sure we'll have some really good stuff to discuss about this, but we're, we obviously disagree. And my point is, is I don't know what we can say when we start talking about Christianity. Um, I'm not sure we can all agree on what that even means to begin with. So if it's Christians that are already like evangelical Protestants in America or, or they have some similar form, then they might hear your message and say, you know what? I do need to stop listening to these skeptics. I need to stop listening to these PhDs over at Myth Vision who aren't Christians or some of them actually are Christians but they're not like evangelical uh, apologist. So they'll say a spade is a spade. If it looks like a contradiction or an issue, they're going to call it what they see it as. And using their scholarship, they come to these conclusions. So we're going to have that. We're going to have that conversation. Um, what's up in the chat? Good to see you, Gary. Good to see you. From a general position, is he pretending to be nuanced in his attack? Derek attacks Christianity. I'm interested to know what Jim Bob's talking about. 
stealing your lightning. General understanding. At all. If the Bible is correct by describing faith as a precious thing, and you're just casually throwing your weak faith in. Second Peter, come on. Even Eusebius thought Peter didn't write Second Peter. But anyway, let's keep going. The fires of criticism without understanding the shape of the argument of landscape first. You're not being wise by trying to minimize your biases. You're being careless. And no, I'm not at all saying that you should Pascal's wager yourself into faith or lower the epistemic bar either. But I will say that you're not performing your duty of inquiry properly, and you're probably going to end up being another statistic or worse if you're not caught. Hold up. <laughs> Eric, what the heck, man? Um, I want to like play that back. Now, I get you're trying to not take the approach that Craig did, but hold on. Let me. Get you're not performing your duty of inquiry properly, and you're probably going to end up being another statistic or worse. If Who's to say that the inquiry that I'm that I'm taking isn't a proper inquiry in terms of skeptically approaching this? I mean, I bet you and me could sing Kumbaya holding hands while approaching Islam. We would both be like, okay, man-made, absolutely. Here's a guy that seems to have had some you know, issues and, and we see the, the text itself um, may go back early to at least Uthman. And I wouldn't be shocked if a lot of the things that are in the Quran come from Muhammad himself, but we would look at this and say man-made and the kind of methodology you and me would approach would be like, yep, 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 yep. We'd probably check off all the ticks in agreement on how we're approaching Islam or any other religion. We get to Christianity and I have countless academics on my channel, PhDs in the field, everything from Harvard, Yale, you name it, you name it. Um, and they're like looking at Christianity like we're looking at Islam. The difference is they're looking at the kind of zeitgeist in the uh, time in which these texts are written, where son of God is important in the Greco-Roman world. So you have Jesus be a son of God. You have these miraculous claims from Asclepius and other deities. And of course, Jesus has to compete with these other people. And there's actually a upcoming episode. Paul, if you're still watching, we're going to have to hook up because not only is Bart Ehrman doing a searching for Moses or finding Moses show or an online course soon, but this coming winter, he's doing one on other virgin births that predate Christianity and are in that same uh, groove. And in fact, if you've ever watched any of Pine Creek stuff, he likes to show when David Wood interviewed Bart Ehrman, while David Wood was jabbing at Islam, Bart Ehrman went, yeah, 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 it's the same thing you would expect when the Christian New Testament authors are writing about these virgin births and things that are popping up in the New Testament that come from that time and area. That same approach and method is being careful. If you already have the conclusion of Christianity being true or you're convinced of the case, right? There might be some baggage that we're bringing in how we're approaching our worldview. And I'm trying to equally approach all of them looking for the human fingerprints. You might say I'm missing the divine hand, but I, I'd say that we're being cautious and careful on our conclusions. Okay, here we go. If you're not cautious. Regarding the fallacy of objections, Waitley went on to write, this is the main and almost universal fallacy of anti-Christians and is that of which a young Christian should be first and principally warned. They find numerous objections against various parts of scripture, to some of which no satisfactory answer can be given, and the incautious here is apt, while his attention is fixed on these, to forget that there are infinitely more and stronger objections against the supposition that the Christian religion is of human origin, and that where we cannot answer all objections, we are bound in reason and in candor to adopt the hypothesis which labors under the least. Wait, okay, I'm curious. Let's have a conversation about that when you get on the show, because sounds like the guy's trying to say all the arguments he's heard made up against Christianity just don't cut it. And so while a Christian may say, hey, I'm not convinced by all these academics you have on, Derek, at least I'd like for them to investigate and see and go from there. But, um, and I'm sure you wouldn't say to them not to as well, but uh, you would want them first to be grounded in their understanding of Christianity, which is the understanding that you would have about Christianity as well. And I'm sure you have a lot of overlap with other Christian apologists as well when it comes to this. But yeah, I'm, I'd love to have a conversation about that. Really is spot on. The reason why I can read Bart Ehrman books listen to historical Jesus classes in secular universities, or watch YouTube counter apologists and be completely untroubled is because I've got the bulk of the Christian evidences under my belt first, for example. So, um, hmm, I feel like I should be talking to you right now about this because I'm like reviewing a video. You're not even here to like have this chat with me and clarify what you actually mean. Let me go ahead and give you the link here because I would rather actually chat with you
and go into this if you're available. I don't think um, I don't think it's. I feel like there's going to be responses you'd have, and then I can actually dive into those deeper with you if you're actually communicating along with your video. Um, let me see. Okay, there you are. All right, I sent it to you because it's like a lot of this stuff. I'd rather hear you clarify or explain what you mean, and then we can go from there. <laughs> Apology. The first step in leaving your faith is abandoning the word evidences. And uh, yeah, anybody have any uh, any questions? Super chat them over. It keeps you from going to hell for all eternity and helps myth and grow. What's up, Eric? Thank you for coming, man. I, I just, look, at, at some point during this, we got to stop and go I'm talking to the air. Because I know you'll have like, well, no, that's not what I meant or actually what I mean. And then it's better to respond to these kind of things. So should I play that back and allow you to respond or? Whatever you want to do, man. Okay. Listen to historical Jesus classes in secular universities or watch YouTube counter apologists and be completely untroubled is because I've got the bulk of the Christian evidences under my belt first. For Real example, quick, so when you said that, are you saying like the reason you're not like on the edge of your seat, like sweating bullets or like feeling like you're going to have a nervous breakdown is because you have a you have built up a strong case that you're convinced of about Christianity that like you can hear any type of criticism coming from people like me or any of these other channels or even the actual academics and whatnot. And you're not like, not able to sleep at night because of it. You're confident in what you believe. Yeah, I mean, I, I talk about it in the next few moments there, but basically um, I think that the case for Christianity has um, lots of different points of evidence that seem to point in the right direction. And just with any good, like science, can you hear me okay? I didn't check my mic. Yeah, my yeah, mic. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so, um, and so even when I do see like sometimes some counter evidence that I'm not on the spot, able to resolve at that particular moment. Uh, I'm not like necessarily losing sleep over it. Now, don't get me wrong. I think there are some good criticisms against Christianity. I'm not saying like there's no good arguments mm -hmm. on your guys' side. That That's ridiculous. Um, what I am saying is that because I, I understand the argumentative landscape, um, I see a lot of predictable patterns and where certain arguments fall. Um, it's like, oh, there's another argument from silence or, you know, there's another um, uh, you know, artificial kind of disharmonization or, or something like artificial. that. Artificial. So like you would say you're, you don't find these disharmonized or you don't I'm find not, them. I, there's, there's such thing as artificial disharmonization. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it happens, but there's also artificial harmonization too. And I'm not advocating that either. Um, and so I, I just would say it, it's like, I see the evidence for Christianity, like, um, a bunch of, uh, links, in a chain, like a chain mail kind of armor type of thing, where it's like if a couple links get hit, the, the whole edifice doesn't collapse uh, yeah, by itself. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So why do you think I, why do you think I don't believe? I mean, I know you can't psychoanalyze. I get it. But like, I do can't. you think, no, I know. And, and you guys don't like people psychoanalyzing. You've made that clear in conversations with me. Yeah. But when I say that, I, like, the evidence to me isn't great. Now, if I wanted to take these texts and say there's this narrative that runs through from Paul's earliest letters to the late book of Revelation, if we will, mm. I find Paul believed that something happened, that Jesus rose from the dead, he experienced or saw him in some way. Then all of a sudden we have these gospels and a narrative in Acts that paints the early church kind of like this— um, communistic community that they held all things together um and that this narrative right all we have are these texts one of the big things that i find happens a lot and i'm throwing this out there is that we have no way to falsify some of these things we have no way to fal falsify some of them yesterday when caleb did his video response for example to apology as flying man and he was giving other I analogies agree of a guy who like floated up and like people witnessed him in like seven different countries. They talk about him, hundreds of witnesses and things like that. I'm thinking to myself, I still wouldn't believe this guy actually flew. Even if the witnesses said all these things, I would still be like, in some way, this guy's either pulling off a trick or stunt, 
Or And then there's other cases he's bringing up that there's people who falsify. They're not trustworthy witnesses, this and that. We don't have any of that for Christianity. We don't have other literature that's showing that these guys are trustworthy or non-trustworthy from people who don't believe. All we have is the literature from people who do believe it. Even then, when you carefully analyze it, they don't agree on many things. And I'm thinking to myself, some of these things are detrimental. Like Paul talks about another gospel and stuff that like let him be accursed. And in the context of the first century, like people believe in cursings and blessings, just like in the Hebrew Bible, they literally would put curses on people. Some of the academics say that that Greek word that we talk about with curse, literally is Paul's cursing them. And so I, I'm just like venting, kind of rabbit trailing into this saying like, I just don't find, I, I, I used to believe, but I don't think it was for the evidence itself. It was more about a combination of my experiences plus what I hoped to be true in the literature. You, do you see what I'm trying to get at? Yeah. I mean, I think we could go back and psychoanalyze each other and we would both be way off probably. So uh, why I could say you don't believe, I, have, I have absolutely have no idea. And I'm not in a good position to judge that. And do you think I, I have a decent stick. case? This is the question I have. Um, I would say, Derek, your channel, out of a lot of the atheist channels, I appreciate the fact that you talk to a lot of different scholars. If I was looking to, if I, what I'm trying to tell people in this video is get the case for Christianity under your belt to where you can steel man it. I'm not saying accept it. Even if you are, if you're a doubting Christian, oh, here's where this is all kind of coming from. Um, I work with Jonathan McClatchy's ministry, mm -hmm. talkaboutdoubts.com. I'm a volunteer. Uh, I counsel doubting Christians over the phone. Also, as you know, as somebody who has a presence on social media and YouTube, you get all kinds of people questioning you, shooting you messages and emails and comments and all that other stuff, at, saying that they're having this or that question or problem or whatever. And so I'm perfectly willing to talk to these people one-on-one, -on, -one, on the phone, video chat or whatever. And I'll say, what is your understanding of the evidences for Christianity? Um, how could you make a, a case for Christianity? What are you familiar with? And it's like a handful of videos off of YouTube sometimes. Maybe they've read Case for Christ by Lee Strobel, maybe. And it was usually like years ago. And they can't even tell you what's, what's in that. Um, but yet they're watching all of these people that are on YouTube. And what I'm trying to say is, um, if faith is a, a precious thing, if, if Christianity is possibly even worth investigating, um, if it's if it's worth investigating and there's reasons why it's worth investigating, um, if there are those reasons, uh, then I think it's epistemically irresponsible to not really have a positive case understanding for it. Then uh, understand the argument of landscape. What, what have people said in response to these objections? And then I would definitely say, Hey, check out Derek from Myth Vision. If you really go go watch his videos with Bart Ehrman and Dale Allison, and um, who is the Paula Friedrichson? Um, oh, and, those and are going to be good too. Yeah, and those kind of people, um, because then you're going to really be able to um, understand what that particular side says. But I think when I watch those videos, like the one the other the one the other day you had with uh, I think it was Gnostic Informant who's hosting your channel, and he was talking to JD Crossan, and I was just like. What? No, <laughs> no, 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 John Dominic no. Crossan? Yeah, John the... Dominic Crossan. Yeah. Yeah. Which one was that one about? He was talking about X. And and so, okay. and I was just thinking like, okay, here's a problem here. Here's a problem here. Here's a problem here. Here's a problem here. And I don't think it's because I just want Christianity to be true so bad. Because I can tell you from experience, believe it or not, take it for whatever it's worth or not. I was an atheist. I spent two years as an atheist. I'm not saying I came to Christianity because of a bunch of my intellectual rigor and heavy investigation. I'm not going to exaggerate that um, and act like I went on this, this great intellectual journey necessarily. I just think I had some basic kind of understanding and common sense and how I, I looked at some of these things about the existence of God and, and looking at the Bible. Um, and so kind of lost my train of thought there you, but anyway you, john Dominic cross and threw you yeah. a wrench and you were like oh hell no i'm not this is yeah not i was just kind of like okay i see why the problems with that argument and because i feel like i've kind of put myself that it's not because i've indoctrinated myself so much because i want christianity to be true so much 
it's just, I didn't want Christianity to be true actually to begin with. I kind of hoped that other religions were true when I even came to believe that there was a God, I was just perfectly willing to be happy with being like a, a deist. Um, and so, but anyways, the point is, is that because I've studied these things, I can see some of the holes and flaws in his argument. Some I'll, I'll watch some of these other atheist YouTubers and I'm just like, here's a problem. There's a problem. There's a problem. And Hey, you got some really good points here. And I think if anything, I have criticized other apologetic arguments. And I think anybody who's followed my channel knows that I'm completely willing to do that. Um, and so anyways, I hope I'm not rambling too much, but well, um, I, I, I'm, not, I just, I'm saying there's a progression here. So, and, so this is the thing, like, I know you're going to disagree. Um, that's why you get into the detail, but that's why I think it's important that people, and I agree with you that people who are going to somehow be critical of Christianity, even the doubting Christians who are talking about them leaving, have sufficient reasons for why you're leaving. If you don't have a sufficient reason, then maybe you should be like, okay, let me really get that reason down pack. But if you don't believe, uh, if you don't have a good case as to why you're not, I think it's important to be able to give a reason. For example, uh, Dominic Crossan said what he said it, pertaining to Acts. I also had um, Jennifer Bird. She came on pertaining to Acts. Jennifer Bird recommended a scholar who just wrote her uh, a commentary on Luke Acts, and I'm having her on. Shelly Matthews, she's coming on soon as well. If Richard Perbo was alive right now, I'd have him on. These are later dates. I've had you know Steve Mason on where he tries to argue a later date of Acts. So like, you would disagree with these academics. You would take an early date. You would say this guy's a companion of Paul. You would take that kind of approach. Whereas I'm looking and saying my approach is the same way I would go to like Islam. I'm looking at this and I'd say, okay, is the Quran early? Does it go back to Muhammad? Is there good reasons to think that some of these, I'll use the term pericope in the Quran, go back to the mouth of the guy? And I'd say, yeah, probably. I can't prove that, but probably. And we do have the lower palimpsest manuscript that kind of rewrote the Quran a little bit that's earlier than the Uthmanic text. But Uthman is like a couple decades after Muhammad, and he like has the standardized version. There are traditions where they're burning other copies, and they're trying to get rid of other versions that were a little earlier. We right. don't know really for sure what right. was on those. I'm approaching this just like I would that, and I'd say, okay, what is our manuscript tradition what are some of the early source material? In what way would this, if we were using a scientific approach to try and discredit theories to see if there's holes in these things, sure. approaching them like that with critical scholarship, and all of them are saying later first century, possibly early second century in the critical scholarship side, it's typically those who want this early. They want this stuff early. And the only other guy I could think of that that I've interviewed in terms of uh, – He's a Matthean posteriority guy. He's also like a pastor or like a bishop in his church who's trying to say, well, I think that uh, Luke Acts is a companion of Paul. And I'm interested in hearing his case, but it's like if we're just talking about one side and getting your strength on, on a positive proposition for Christianity, we might be missing a whole lot of information that's falsifying it or at least giving good reason to doubt. Sure. You see what I'm no, trying to get at? Yeah, and I'm not saying completely ignore that information altogether at all. I'm, I'm not at all saying that. Um, but if they I, come, if they start, sorry, I just want to make this point. Sure. I, what you're saying. If they start with, let me solidify my understanding in Christianity, and they're getting your understanding or McCrew's understanding with Jonathan McClatchy, or they're trying to understand these particular arguments from certain Christians— and there are other Christians who are not apologists, who say these are later, who say there are contradictions in their issues. They have no problem with believing in Christianity. They just don't have this maximalist case that's going to try and yeah. like, you see what I'm trying to get at. Yeah, I would say that those people are living in a state of cognitive dissonance, to be honest with you. They're, 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 uh, to say I believe that it's a Christian, but I don't know, I can't really talk about that historically. I think that's a problem. I think those people aren't living consistently. I'm not necessarily encouraging them to abandon their faith. But I am going to say that you should reconsider your approach. And I think that New Testament scholars, even Christian scholars, um, fall into extremely bad, bad habits. Even ones that I would consider very conservative, like Mike Lacona, Craig Keener, Craig Evans, different things like that. I mean, if you read um, Lydia McGrew's book, uh, if The Mirror of the Mask or, or the Eye of the Beholder, she criticizes a lot of the habits that they fall into uh, because they're making similar kind of 
arguments like arguments from silence or uh, ignoring uh, the real uh, world possibilities of, of independent information and different things like that. Um, and, and when just, you just when so I hear when I hear an apologist say like, oh, yeah, yeah, I believe the resurrection. I believe I can prove that historically. But then they say, well, what about the virgin birth? And they go, well, I, I believe that as a as a Christian or if they do like Craig Keener and say, well, you know, I have a, a Holy Spirit epistemology. Um, I, I don't think that's good. I, I don't recommend that. I don't think Christians should live with divided minds like that. So the versions of Christians that are, are that are giving those kind of arguments, they just don't suffice for your for for your point of view. And I, I hear I, you use McGrews a lot. They're like a huge, like you really sure. follow in line with them a lot. And there's nothing wrong. That's that's your choice. Um, just like I have many. I mean, if there's a critical scholar who's not coming at this with the conservative, I need absolute exegesis approach because. This is the problem I fell into as a Christian. I'm looking for absolute exegesis. And then I find out the New Testament authors who are quoting, doing composite scriptures, or even referencing Hebrew Bible scriptures to recontextualize it in their own context in the New Testament. They're not even taking the original context of text in the Hebrew Bible. When they use it, they use it in their own manner, kind of like a Pesher type technique, where it's it's radically different than the original context. So as a Christian, when I was a, a conservative Christian— that was eisegesis, and I didn't even realize that that was what the Christian scriptures were doing because I said, no, they had a, a double meaning. There was a shadow of a meaning in the Hebrew scriptures that in its original meaning, it was kind of like this is foreshadowing the reality of something that's going to come. Talking about stuff that Matthew does. Matthew specifically mentioned some of this stuff, but even when they're like referencing the Hebrew scriptures, Paul does this. I've had yeah, Christopher Paul. and other people, they talk about how he's using the Hebrew scriptures and then using them in his own context – kind of ripping them out of their own context originally to use it for his own purposes. And that is yeah. technically eisegesis as, as I right. was as a Christian. Well, I think even a, a middle of the road scholar like Mark Goodacre would say that they're historicizing scripture versus pulling scripture out and then building a story around it. I think they're like, I have this historical event in mind and what is the scripture that fits in with it? They're also not doing anything that's not necessarily inconsistent with um, some of the other uh, rabbis and, I agree. and writers of that time. So it's not really completely inconsistent with the milieu that they're in. And, no and, disagreement um, there. Yeah. And again, it's like there's two different ways of looking at that. Uh, I think Goodacre has a good point. I think you've even had Goodacre on. And, you know, he's not a staunch conservative or anything like that. He's, no. he's actually very, uh, very middle of the road, and um, I would say. And so um, – I would say that's probably what they're doing there. But there's so many different directions, obviously. I know, talk. I know. Yeah. But that's why, like, I just, when we're looking at these scholars, the ones that I've been interviewing on Myth Vision are, like, they're not as well-known. I mean, maybe Bart Ehrman is, of course. But I'm sure, saying, sure. like, like, as a Christian in the Christian world, they're already kind of insulated from really investigating and hearing all of these arguments. And I feel well, they, like the last thing we need to do is insulate them more unless you really are trying to protect them from possibly hearing arguments that might rip it in I half. And, you think, know what I, mean? I think critical scholars can act as if they are um, – he might not like this, but like uh, uh, like the like the orthodox view of, of – we need, you need us to interpret the scriptures for you almost. Now, I won't. I know they won't say that, and I, I know that sounds harsh. Do you harsh. think it's possible the McCrews are saying the same thing? No, you think I, it's don't, possible? I, don't, I don't think that they're saying that. I think what I think that they, their kind of arguments and these older kind of arguments that they're reviving uh, have simply just fallen out of fashion, and I think a lot of people aren't even aware of them. I mean, I saw your interview with um, uh, Allison. He had no idea what undesigned coincidences were. Mm -hmm. um, he, he doesn't know what they are. He's not paying attention to that kind of stuff. He, he, he's just not interested. I, I'm saying, is it possible that these particular scholars, even Christian scholars, and I've seen even what I would consider conservative scholars, uh, are poss can possibly also be involved in a kind of groupthink? And it's kind of nice to have somebody outside of the main sphere who specializes in epistemology and has a degree in literature, has a PhD in philosophy, and it specializes again in epistemology to come in and say, wait a second, like you you guys are improperly ev evaluating testimony. Why don't you just take these ideas out for a test spin 
How many academics, how many academics are there out there that agree with the McCrews? Like that are like probably PhDs not, in the field. Probably not very many, but I mean, to, to the fact that you this have does, a, this is not. I'm not. This is a fallacy. Yeah. If I was trying to argue but, that but, this is like an but how many? Thing, but. How many are even aware? How many have taken the time? How many can really steal me in their argument? Even again, I hate to bring up Dallas, and I'm not trying to throw him under the bus at all. But in his book, where he touches on the McGrews, uh, where he talks about apologetics and resurrection, he he completely strawmans their argument. He says that they're, that they're arguing for the facticity of of John or something like that. And and I'm like, that's Dale. That's not at all what they're saying. If you carefully read their article. Um, Apologia threw this out there. I just noticed this, Paul, forgive me if you're still in the chat, Eric, how is it possible to still man Christianity when statistically most Christians will disagree with your version or any given version presented? Uh, Paul, if you want to respond back, um, I would say, are you talking about like, are you making an argument from religious diversity? Um, that's what I would be curious about. Now, if, if you are making that argument, um, there's a really helpful channel, Derek, and you're, you're, you're atheist uh, or skeptical, friend, Christian friends, anybody, anybody interested in learning about Christianity. There's a really good channel called Ready to Harvest. I don't know if you've heard of it, mm-hmm. um, but it, it's, a, it's a Christian guy, but he is as neutral as I've ever seen somebody humanly possible. And he goes through all of the different Christian denominations, okay? Um, the, the ones that we would consider like cultish uh, to Catholics, Baptists, he compares them, he contrasts them. Um, and I asked him um, after doing this channel for several years, like, does all this religious diversity bother you? Does it cause you to question your faith whatsoever? And he's like, absolutely not. He's like, it if anything, it, either when I was a Christian, yeah, it, it's like, it's, it, if anything, it strengthens my faith because I find so much upon what we agree about. Well, why is it that when we though now, and, and I want to g- get Paul had a response here, but why is it that now that we're not believers, we look at this and we recognize this as an issue. So now we realize, hold on in our bubble. Of course there were fake Christians. The new Testament already kind of coaches you on antichrist and people who think that they're the true followers and stuff like that. It already kind of gives you this in group out group. And if you think you're right, no, it just shows you even better. And for, in fact, one of the apologists years ago, I don't know if it was William Lynn Craig or others, they said the the truth is so good that it's surrounded by nine lies. Like, so more people are going to like make a mistake when they get close. And of course, we're always right, and everyone else is but, right. But are are they really wrong when it comes to um, issues that pertain to salvation? I mean, I don't think so. And I think um, I'm not reformed, but I think the Westminster Confession of Faith has a really good line where it basically says that the Bible is clear about things that pertain to salvation. And on the things that aren't pertaining to salvation, it's not so clear. I just had um, my my father-in-law and, and my brother-in-law try and argue with me about my views on eschatology because they believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. And I'm not so, I don't, I'm not yeah, so sure I mean, about that. Eschatology, so, you know. right. But but I'm sitting there saying so if well, they're not a Trinitarian, are they are they saved? If they think that Unitarianism is true or Jesus was not God, are they saved? I I would say no. I would say they're not saved, right. just to do to, to be frank. Um but well, I think, I'd rather you be honest and just tell yeah, us. But, but I think but I think that I don't think that the diversity that you're discussing uh in the early church is as strong as maybe critics have made it out to be. I think a lot of this springs from a guy by the name of F. C. Bauer. Um, who was writing, I want to say, in the uh, early or late 19th century. Um, I could be wrong about that. I know Ehrman takes a lot of his stuff from that. Uh, there's a good book uh, that I would recommend people, to, if they want to read the other side, called The Heresy of Orthodoxy uh, by Michael J. Kruger, and I think it's Andreas Kostenberger, um, who teach at Reformed Theological Seminary, uh, that ref- they, they, they contest that hypothesis of it being so diverse. I'm not saying they're, they're not saying there's no diversity, um, but they would contest some of those claims that the Christianity was just so diverse on all of these different areas. Again, I'm not saying there wasn't any diversity whatsoever. That would be ridiculous. Uh, but how just, often, how often are Christians out there telling it like it is with that? Hold on one second. So apologies sure. is no, I just mean, how can anyone taking your advice be sure that they've got it? That they could actually repeat the argument back to um, somebody in a way that they would actually understand it. Um, I don't think that anybody is correctly arguing for or against anybody's view until they can give the person who's giving the view in a way that they would say, yes, you got it. Um, And so if I was making like a response video at Apologia and he was like, what the heck, man, that's not even what I was saying. 
then I didn't do my due diligence. I failed at some point and I should have asked him. I should have clarified. I should have read the sources that he was reading to get a better understanding of what he was trying to say. And so um, that's what I'm that's what I'm trying to say. Um, yeah, I am kind of biased towards the maximal case. Maybe Paul's referring to that um, because I think that other cases for the resurrection are weak. Um, but that, that I, you know, what, whatever. I mean, that's maybe a different topic. Okay, so <clears throat> I'm going to hit this next super chat here. Humanist Reformation says, funny that these holy scriptures are from God for all to read, but the things it says aren't what they plainly say. So much special pleading because Jesus lied, so we need to change the text. Yeah, it's funny. Last time I was on, this fella uh, left me like 15 comments. Um, no no offense, buddy, but uh, it was all the same comment on 15 different videos, and so um, I've already pointed you to the resource uh, between Hartke and, and Bram, and people can make their own decisions there. I think yep. that's what he's probably referring it's to. Probably pre preferring, uh, yeah, referencing the fall, uh, felled apocalyptic material in the yeah, New Testament. He is, and um, I that would be. And I, I agree. I do. I do think. Yeah, that yeah. Matt, I, I, think I think that there's failed apocalyptic material for sure. I think if I, if I was going to argue against Christianity, that would probably be one of the first places that I would go. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying that it's a bad argument. I would just say, watch the debate. If you like Matthew's side better, um, then Matthew did a good job convincing you. Um, and so oh, I was already, I, I was already convinced. But no, I <laughs> right, no not saying. you, not you. Humanist reformation. Um, just because he left me so many comments with the same comment before. Uh, he really likes his subjection. Um, I have no problem with the guy, but when I get the same comment on 15 different videos that have nothing to do with this topic, with this particular question, it's like, I can only refer you to that particular video so many different times. Bram lists a ton of different sources that he pulled from in that particular video, uh, as well as his stream with uh, Than of Exploring Reality. Uh, read his book, check, check the sources, steel man that argument. And if you still think it's lacking, um, then that, that you, that's your right. Thank you for that super chat, humanist. But isn't asking me what I meant going against your advice? <laughs> good, good job, Paul. Um, no, because again, I'm talking about there's a progression. Okay. So, Paul, um, I get people who they like your videos. You trouble them. You're doing a good job um, being your uh, atheist uh, 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 counter apologist self. Okay. But when I ask them, okay, what have you studied on the evidence for Christianity? And they're like, uh, I read like a couple chapters on guard. You know, it's like that meme. It's like, well, that's on me. I set the bar too low, uh, you know? And so I'm just like, okay, well, that's, that's not good. Okay. We, what it, you need to be. And even then they can't even give you a, a good argument for Christianity. So what I'm saying is that if Christianity is possibly true, if there are at least prima facie reasons to investigate it, um, Com compared to other religions, sometimes other religions just don't make claims that are worth investigating. We can talk about that if you want. Then if it's worth investigating, then it's best to get that particular argument first. So I'm, I'm basically making something similar to Pascal's wager, but I'm not saying just believe your way into it against your will and just act like it's true, even though you're not really sure, because that's stupid and people can't do that. Okay. I, I made a video on Pascal's wager defending it before. I will eventually debunk myself, okay? What I am saying is that it's worth your time investigating to make sure. And that would be understanding the Christian evidences, being able to steel man that particular argument to where you got that under your belt first, understand the argument of landscape, understand the common objections and how Christians have answered them for centuries, then dive into myth vision, then dive into apologia. Uh, then fi find that one video that really bothers you and, 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 and work through it. And if you, after a fair investigation go, I don't really think that there's anything to this, then I'm not going to sit and point a finger at you and say you are ir epistemically irresponsible, but the vast majority I'm, I'm on TikTok, I see people I'm deconstructing their faith on Christianity all the time who are saying stupid things like, well, the canon got invented by a bunch of random dudes at Nicaea. And it's like, no, that's not where the canon came from. You're, you're having other skeptics, atheist academic people on TikTok like Dan McClellan saying, stop it. You're wrong. Right. <laughs> okay. But that's like, what I do on Myth Vision. I also yeah, yeah. do that on Myth Vision. Yes, so yes. Not... And that's good. That's yeah. good. You're, you're one of the good guys compared to a lot of people. I'm saying what I'm seeing a lot of when I'm talking to people one-on-one -on -one, or I'm just 
watching people even on YouTube or on social media and they're giving their reasons for why they are deconstructing and they're just awful. You know, I had, a, I saw the other day, a girl say, well, you know, do you Jesus, think that there's, there's, let's flip the roles here. Cause sure. we, I'm with you. I get it. There's some people you'd be like, what? And, and to you, it may seem ridiculous. For example, some people might have sexual problems. Like they, they are worried about their sin in terms of sex. And I've heard a lot of Christians mock that. They think it's a joke that people might have an issue with masturbating or whatever. And they think that deconverted you from Christianity. But when you're obsessed, when you are obsessed about this worldview and the flesh is an evil thing, and really you got to hate this flesh, this, this flesh that we dwell in that is causing us to sin. And this is the perception it teaches you when you think, hold on. Maybe now I see it as a natural phenomena that humans have just because we're a creature that has evolved here like all other species on earth and we're sexually driven. I'm fighting this urge that I'm built this way by a God that is like saying, hey, you're wicked, you're flesh, you're evil. And then that causes them to say this worldview, like, like if it's true, I'm trapped in a body that God's put me in. And so they have more of a psychological reason as to why they can't find this like worldview the, to the make Frank, the most sense through their experience. The, the Frank Turek, they choose sex over Jesus thing. I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't. Mean, get, I, mean, I don't. I don't. I don't get into that. I mean, I, again, it's just like, is it is it true? I, I, I think that would be an unhealthy way of looking at sex to begin with. Um, and if that's going to spin you into apostasy, um, that, that, that's not good. I, I would say, talk talk to your pastor. Get some well. Depends on who your pastor I mean, that's, is, I guess. Everything depends on who your pastor is, I guess. But everything but, you're saying, like even in your video, you're talking about like, hey, you're doubting. Well, come to a community of us. We'll convince you. This is how it sounds to atheists like us. We'll convince you to want to stay. We'll we'll give you reasons why those aren't good reasons. And and um, no, I'm saying we'll convince I'm, you that your truth is true. And we'll just what keep I'm, you in that faith group. What I'm saying is, is a lot of times when I talk to people about their doubts, their questions. And I say, okay, what, what evidence are you familiar with? And they're like, can't tell me hardly anything. And I'll, oh, okay. And I'll say, well, what's one of the one things that's bothering you the most? And they'll throw out like maybe a contradiction or maybe it's some, some other area it could be the problem of evil, which, which that's why I became an atheist for a season was the problem of evil. Um, that's, that one's a bit stronger. Um, but anyways, um, if they aren't being able to articulate a good argument for Christianity, I'll say, okay, let's talk about a couple of your objections. And then let me just give you some positive case. And you can just think about this. And most of the time they're like, once they see the positive evidence for something, all the objections against it kind of melt away because again, it's like links in a chain. And it, it, it some of that, it just a little bit subsides. It doesn't mean that they don't want to look into that later or talk about that later. But I'm saying when there's a bunch of positive evidence for something, just like in any good scientific theory, there's evidence against evolution, okay? But does it mean like that because there's some anomalies and things that we can't explain about human evolution that we just completely ditch that theory 100% altogether? Now, I know some Christians might get mad at me. I'm not even, I don't even have a strong side one way or the other on that particular argument. But the point, the point that I'm trying to say is, is that you don't throw out a good theory when you have, if I have hundred different lines of evidence pointing to the truth of the reliability of the gospels. And I have six contradictions that Bart Ehrman brought up that are tricky. And like, now when you say reliability, we, we I think we should talk about some of this evidence for a second, because sure. you're, you're talking about positive evidence for the case of Christianity. Right. So when you're saying the reliability of the gospels, you're mm -hmm. saying the historical reliability that what these gospels say is what happened. I'm not saying what these gospels say is what happened. What I'm saying, it's more nuanced than that. Um, and so this is where a lot of people get confused. I'm saying it's what it would go back to what the original eyewitnesses claimed, because there are multiple lines of evidence that the uh, people who are writing the gospels uh, do not show themselves to be people who felt free to change and invent facts or put words in the mouth of Jesus or different things. Do they like that say that they're stories. eyewitnesses though? That's what I'm saying. Like, well, the author of John certainly does, and Luke talks about interviewing eyewitnesses. And, and you're talking about John and, twenty and twenty-one, right? Uh, Nineteen thirty-five is one, I believe. Twenty thirty and through thirty-one, mm -hmm. uh, twenty-one, twenty-four through twenty-five. Uh, you have the prologue of Luke, um, and so what I'm saying is there is multiple lines of evidence uh, that 
they were scrupulous, that they were habitually truthful, and that they were close up to the facts. And what they're saying is goes. Why back is it to all these scholars the saying no? Do. Why is it that I'm talking to all these academics and they're saying no, they're not? They're not being as, as factual and as accurate as you're you're saying. And, I don't and, think and some of these are Christians. And I'm like, sure. okay, well, they're not, there's no axe to grind because they're not like out here trying to say Christianity isn't true and I want to prove it, but they're like, this is the material, this is the evidence, what we're dealing with. And no, this isn't this isn't as great a evidence for your case to try and prove Christianity through an apologetic route than you think. I'm not so sure they're even familiar with some of the evidence that I would bring forward, to be completely honest with you. Um, and I think that they often show a lot of bad habits, um, like a preference for complex over simple theories. You see, I, I see Bart Ar Ehrman constantly making arguments from silence. Um, I mean, again, because I have some of these evidences under my belt first, and I've looked at these different things, and even where I see evangelical scholars making, uh, what failing you, to make these crucial distinctions and different things like that. Um, would it Mark, though, assuming Mark's getting eyewitness testimony here, making an assumption from silence? Because nowhere does Mark say he's a witness or the people he's talking to is a witness. Nowhere in no. Mark, you have to go to John and then build this type of case to assume. No, I don't think that you have to do that because you have early, you have very, uh, pretty early evidence um, that. Uh, multiple um, early church fathers who agree that uh, Mark was basically that's Peter's late. scribe. Yeah, that's, I mean, all of this stuff though, you, it, look, there's no convincing you, right, with my arguments. You're not going to convince me with your arguments here. I, I just want, I, I think our discussion today isn't about like debating the issues or trying to prove I'm right, you're wrong, or vice versa. It's really to give my whole goal is to simply say with your video response, you've got a hundred things you would be ready to go and show positive evidence. And I've got a hundred things to show you that you're jumping the gun and have different approach. And it's not me necessarily. And I'm no. not referencing oh, no, the I'm, McCrews. I'm, not, I'm sure. not referencing an exclusive scholar. I'm taking a band of other academics. Now you could say that you think the reasonings are wrong, but I've got all of these other academics that would say there's tons of these reasons. A lot of them are saying the same thing. Some of them are saying a little different, but they're in agreement on the issues, things like that. And I feel like that doubting Christian who doesn't know what they're talking about should be able to go to any of these particular uh, are videos. Still there, Derek? Can you can you see me? You're you're blocked. Okay, you're back. Well, you're glitchy. You there, Eric? Yo, yo, yo. Did I lose him? Oh, man. Let me write him and let him know. Sorry, everybody. The inter He already warned me before he jumped on that his internet was going to be choppy. So, um, writing him on Messenger here real quick. Yeah, he froze. All right. Um, but we'll wait for him to unglitch. It's probably going to kick him here in just a second. All right. Well, um, once he's back, yeah, it kicked him. Um, once he's back, we'll continue. Humanist Reformation. Yeah, I say that tactics video where you never mention the part where he calls it a superstition. That was the other comment. Why leave facts out? So I think that's for Eric. I'll try and come back to this. Thank you for the super chat for real. Appreciate the support. Um, again, is it investigating when you ignore facts you don't like? Christians ignore words that don't fit their narrative. Another comment I left on your video. Thank you for that super chat. I'll ask Eric if he's able to get back on. Okay, starting. He said he's restarting his router. All right. So, yeah, my goal is not like to convince anybody just like he's not going to convince me on his arguments while we're on channel. It's stuff you have to chew on. But I want people, I want people to see the things I was never told or shown when I was a Christian. I was, for the Bible told me so. That's who I was. That's what I believed. And it was accurate. I mean, there was no doubts about that. And it was the truth. I think that a lot of the apologists are getting more sophisticated in their approach and saying, well, we're not inerrantist. We do believe that there might be a few little hiccups here and there, but ultimately God has inspired it. Um, hold on. got a message here. 
if you, uh, Eric, if you can hear me, feel free to jump on, man. Feel free to, if you want to, I know your internet sucks. We can do this in the future too. Um, I'll continue playing the clip actually so that everybody is up to speed on what the review, what I think about the review and stuff. Um, let's just do that. Over and over again, when I see people making objections to the gospels, I see examples of overreading, making argument from silence, ignoring the possibility of independent access to real events and so forth. I also understand and, if I don't know why Jesus said- Sorry, I had to pause there. We were just getting into that a little bit. Like, um, we can try to, I think it's an argument from silence to assume that these are eyewitness testimonies. Nowhere in the gospel of Mark or Matthew, Luke says that he's gotten other accounts that he thinks are reliable, but this is the best one that he's writing. And many of the academics I talk to think that Luke is trying to create a better gospel than the ones that are before, whoever the author of Luke is. Uh, we're also having to make this assumption, as you guys recently saw a discussion between Robin Faith Walsh and my buddy Jonathan Sheffield on did Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John actually write Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I think it's important that whoever's going to take this serious and investigate this stuff, if you really want good evidence of why people like these academics don't buy the apologist arguments, come check out my channel. Come check out Paul Agias. He's been interviewing academics as well. He also is an ex-Christian. I just, I wish that, um, and maybe if I heard some of these complaints from these doubting Christians who don't really know much about what they're talking about, maybe I would voice with uh, Eric a little here and say, look, you need to wrap your head around some of this material. But I just think that I, when I was in the Presbyterian church, when I had doubts or I had struggles or whatever, they want to get you in closer to keep you in the community, to keep you tight knit into Christianity. And I think the reason is natural, the repercussions. Is it really worth risking it? We get into that whole issue of, you know, Pascal's wager. And it does play some role, I think, in the minds of most Christians. So anyway, let's continue the uh, video here. There we go. Said such and such, or why Leviticus has this weird command, or I don't know how to resolve this apparent discrepancy right at the moment that my whole edifice is going to collapse. The evidence for Christianity is a whole lot tougher than that, as Waitley indicates. The same thing is true about a well-established scientific theory. We don't just throw out a good theory based on some counter evidence that we don't exactly know how to answer yet. So if you're... Uh, you know, um, it's kind of a bit repetitive in my, in my point of view. I mean, Dr. Joshua Bowen's book just came in yesterday, The Atheist Handbook to the Old Testament, reading Francesca Stavrakopoulou or Daniel McClellan and things like that. Um... You know, that they'll show kind of the like the human elements to the Hebrew Bible and in its original ancient Near Eastern context. We can read the church fathers and how they kind of interpret a lot of these passages, even ones that the New Testament isn't referencing, um, to kind of like point out that this is secretly discussing Jesus or whatever. But if you get to its original context, you start seeing this isn't what in its context, you have to kind of think, in a sense, kind of magical thinking, in my opinion to assume that like what's really going on here is this is talking about Jesus here or something like that. Um, let us make man in our own image. That's the Trinity, right? Or things like that. And instead of seeing this, like even Heiser at least does where he sees it as a pantheon of, of sons of God, the Elohim and the council uh, that is surrounding the Supreme deity. And uh, you see this council in other areas of scripture and stuff. So I am all for trying to get down to the, to what's actually going on. Um, but I don't know if we're only going to get that from the Christian apologist. <laughs> I know that we're probably not going to hear a ton of things as far as I've seen in my experience within Christianity is that they're not showing it all. Right. Um, okay. You're back. Holy crap. You're back. <laughs> Let's continue. Yeah, sorry, sorry about that. It happens again. Just don't it's worry. a rapture, man. Look, continue we, on without me. <laughs> the rapture yeah. might be a real thing. So it's I'm probably been... wrong. Everybody repent. Um, yeah. Here Pascal's wager yourself into it. <laughs> <laughs> You're easily troubled and shaken by listening to counter apologists on YouTube. Here's my advice. Stop listening to them, at least for a season. Stop it. Get some help. Learn the positive case for Christianity <laughs> first. And here I'm not talking about a handful of philosophical arguments for the existence of God and some minimal facts argument for the resurrection. At this point, I'm sure skeptics will laugh and say that I'm just circling the wagons and telling you to indoctrinate yourself first. And that's exactly what a lot of the comments actually said. And you do know why they say that real quick. We'll pop this up. You do realize why they say that, right? Sure. 
Yeah, I mean, I understand. Of course, they're going to say that. If 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 an atheist channel were saying, and and I get it, you may not because you'll be careful about what you're listening to, what they're saying, and things like that. Maybe some of the atheists outright didn't even watch the whole video, or they even with you saying this, it still doesn't satisfy their. Uh, I guess you say what they think you're really doing here. It sounds like let's insulate and protect the bubble to help these doubting Christians not leave Christianity for dumb reasons. But really it's, Hey, call our hotline at the end. If you're doubting or contact us, we'll give you all of the evidence for Christianity's truth. And then once you have that, you have some strength in it. Then you can actually go watch these other videos or see these other channels and not have to stress as much. You get like, that's what they're thinking of it as. Well, what I'm saying is, is, Steel man the argument for Christianity first, and then steel man the argument from the other side. What is and Christianity? What would, what would be objectionable to that, though? What is oh, Christianity? Um, Christianity, I mean, I would say what basically we all would agree on, that God is the creator of the universe, that he sent his son, uh, who is God incarnate, to die for our sins, and who was resurrected, and ascended to heaven and is going to return soon. That would include Catholics, Coptics, Orthodox, and Protestants of various stripes. I mean, um, I guess. You, so, I mean, in the most basic form, I mean, it's just people who would affirm something like the Nicene Creed or something like that. Um, I, I think the Nicene Creed is something that's based on biblical principles. Um, and then I, I know you're like, well, it's the wild, wild West. And, mm -hmm. you know, whoever's writing first Peter and, or first John doesn't agree with Paul and, and, and whoever's writing Luke doesn't agree with Paul. Mm -hmm. um, the book of Paul's, revelation doesn't agree with others. Paul. Yeah, whatever. But yeah. that's fine. We can have that discussion and there's materials that I would recommend people to go ahead and read that, um, that are going to talk about the arguments for that. And they're going to talk about the arguments against it. And then people are free to decide that's a good argument at that point or not. And so I don't think really when it boils down to it, um, and I'm just trying to boil it down in case I lose you, you lose me again. Um, just steel man the argument on your side first, and then learn to steel man the argument on somebody else's side. I, I don't see why that's to terribly wrong or, or bad, or like I'm just telling people to indoctrinate themselves first, you know, like, no. Um, now I will say that, because of the claims that Christianity makes, um, if it, the evidence for it can't just be easily brushed aside, then it is something that would be worth investigating your time to make sure that it's true or not. Um, and so I know people could bring up like the, the many gods objection to Pascal's wager and go, are you going to tell a Muslim to do that? And I'm going to say no, because I don't think prima facie, there's a lot of good reasons to be a Muslim in the first place, because there is no miracle to inve investigate really. There is, Muhammad repeatedly said, I'm just a warner. I'm just a warner, guys. He refused to perform miracles. The only thing he gave us was, make, if, if, if you think I don't have revelation, make another surah like mine. Okay, how do I test that? I have no, I have no way to historically or, or, or scientifically test that, okay? So, but I'm saying that Christianity makes other claims that can stand under historical scrutiny um, like, or at least- Give me or, some examples. Or, or at least have, at least makes a historical claim that can be historically scrutinized. Mm -hmm, okay. Mm -hmm. And, and so, um, yeah, I, I think you're right. In, so I think it's silly to act like nobody could rewrite a book better than the Quran or like that. Sure. But then again, when, within the culture, this is the kind of stuff they did in these, in these traditions where they had competitions of poetry who would write better literature and things like this. This is something they did in Arabia, but as far as the new Testament claims go, I, I th I'm with Bart on this that like you can't you can't prove in any way, shape, or form the claims. It's a faith matter. It's something that you have to believe. You can't no, prove it. I, well, I'm I'm gonna say that I'm gonna push back on that to a certain extent. No, you can't prove it with 100 percent certainty. Of like, course I not. Could, I could prove like the law of gravity. Okay. No, and and, um, and I'm not even claiming that this is even close to that kind of yeah. test. What what we I'm have... saying is is that there's not one particular spectacular piece of evidence for Christianity. But there are multiple lines of evidence, um, internal and both external, uh, that when you take a bunch of different pieces of evidence, they can uh, mount up a, a sufficient case that would be equal to one spectacular piece of evidence. The only thing that I'm saying is, is at least leave testimony on the table. And I think that's yeah. something that we've talked about before, where a lot of skeptics will say, no, testimony is not going to work. And it goes back to, well, why don't more people believe this? Why don't more people believe this? Well, because they're they're infected by David D.H. Strauss or D.F. Strauss or whatever. 
Um, and, and he talked about that you can't do that. There's a, what was his name, Trolsch or whatever, that basically just reinvigorated Hume's argument. Um, you have but Bart would, Ehrman who said that you can never enough. Is you can really... never say, you can never say uh, we can never say historically that a miracle is it's the most improbable thing. This is what Bart Ehrman says. But uh, Gerd, Gerd Ludeman says like science proves Eric, that resurrections Eric, don't happen with the testimony stuff. Like, yeah, you're making a huge, huge claim that is requiring your I'm, entire life's devotion. Like the Kyle question, this goes sure. right back to that same issue, and it's like. These are people, these are humans that are making a claim. Right. When it so, boils down to it, you only have like maybe, if you want to grant John as a guy who's claiming and and I am an eyewitness to his majesty and like things that could be written, the whole world couldn't contain them and things like that. You can add that in as eyewitness if you want, but there's other, there's other scholars who also would be very skeptical of this entire right, chapter and right. stuff. Um, but Paul is the only guy that is like New Testament eyewitness and who's writing down this creed in, in his letters that is saying he has in some way seen the Lord. Now you go to Luke and John and you would say, seen the Lord. Here's, here's how they saw the Lord. Um, I just don't know how writing in these books or even the testimony in these ancient texts, when we don't have alternative accounts, we don't have any other, it's almost unfalsifiable in some respects because we don't have any material that is right. speaking against it like we do with Mormonism, with Joseph Smith, or we so, see with other somewhat contemporaneous sure. claims. So you're going to have to go back and you're going to have to look at what the author is like. Um, you're going to have to look. Are, are they honest? Are they scrupulous? Are they um, somebody who is trying to report facts and not just embellish things? And then when somebody – you see that repeatedly over and over and over again, different signs of truth, um, and this is where we just have to – yeah, we disagree. Yeah. We just have to we have to actually get into the evidence. I know, and um, that's because, the thing. Because what I would like, Derek, what would be great for me is if, if you could come and tell me and say, Eric, this is this is your argument for Christianity as I understand it. And I could say yes, and then you could tell me why you don't believe it. Then then we could like now we could have like a, a discussion. But I um I'm I, until like you're familiar with that side, and I I I could stand and familiarize myself more with your side. So not throwing any rocks at all. Um, I know we disagree, but that's because I feel like um, just as you could say, I'm telling people to like insulate myself. Mm -hmm. uh, the vast majority of the people that you have are, are some sort of skeptical bent. Even if they're, mm -hmm. they're Christian, you're not going to have, um, you could, I'm not saying you wouldn't, you have me on obviously right now. So, I mean, that's, and you have people debate and you've had um, uh, uh, Sheffield and mm -hmm. he, he's somebody I like and agree with on a lot of things. Um, but it, it could also equally be like somebody could equally say, well, you just have this particular blend, you know, it's oh, yeah. mostly it, skeptical. It is. And that's not it, a strike against you. That's your channel. That that's your audience. Exactly that's what, what people I want. Do. That's exactly what, people what want. I do. Yeah. And that's yeah. what people want. And it's not a strike against you. That's why I would recommend somebody who has the bulk of the Christian evidences under their belt um, and, and, and knows the argument of landscape. I would say, go watch Myth Vision. You'd be probably my first recommendation if it comes to gospel issues, you'd be number one. Okay. Phil, phil philosophy would be Joe Schmidt. Um, those would be the two channels that I would say go to and, and watch um, because you guys are having the highbrow stuff on, on the channel. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 I think that like in every point that you bring up, we disagree on like how we're viewing this literature and even if they have certain facts that are correct you would say this leans in like the trustworthiness of these authors and i, I would say I'm, that i'm saying why would they make these claims under the context that they would make these claims in the context that they would make these claims if these go back to what the original eyewitnesses claimed and they were willing to endure labors dangers and sufferings and sometimes death um i'm not saying i'm not going to make the stupid argument that every single apostle died as a martyr um, I think we have good evidence for like Paul and Peter and uh, James and James brothers, Jesus's brother. Um, but I'm saying, why are they making these claims under this particular context? That's what lends support to a miracle. And so the point that I'm making is testimony is sufficient when the alternate explanations are more ad hoc and worse. Um, that is evidence for a miracle. When the explanation is like worse than the actual explanation that a See, miracle I, occurred. I, I, that's when it's evidence yeah, for a we, miracle. What we disagree skeptic, on that that point yeah. there because so there's so much to get into here, and I don't think we'll have the time, and we probably should go into more examples in the future. 
But um, for me, like, I don't see the Gospels as that. And, like, there's other things before we even get into, like, well, this is evidence for a miracle, and we're talking about literature. And if I compare this to other literature in the time, I'm not – I'm, I'm going to read things that – our biographies like Suetonius and other people that are contemporaneous Plutarch and even using examples of like Herodotus and stuff and go, well, what's going on here? But the gospels seem like literature, not like here are eyewitness biographical accounts literally of what happened. It sounds more like literature to me. We're already starting with completely two different frameworks. Yeah. So yeah, we're going sure. to draw two completely different conclusions at the end of the day. Right. I think we'd have more common ground if we approached Paul rather than going to these gospels and trying to discuss what I think Paul's up to and what's going on in his letters. But even then, I think we should probably go in a future date and dig into certain material and go into it. I think you're going to want to check out Shelly Matthews interview that I'm doing with her. She says Acts is second century. Uh, I think she says Luke and Acts. I'm not sure. I, I think she, they're both the same author. She says it's second century and she's going to go into why we're going to do an episode here and I know you'll be like all over this. And I hope you do a <laughs> video response saying why she's wrong. I, I'd love to have you pick it apart. Um, sure. She says, this is not a companion of Paul. Um, and so it'll be really cool to see like you engage that material from someone who just wrote a commentary oh, on this particular stuff. Yeah. I mean, I think Acts is probably the most historically defensible book in all of, all of really? the Testament. I mean, yeah, you have, you have Colin Hammer um, who documents 84 different facts um, where Paul is traveling all throughout the, the Greco-Roman Empire, whatever, and um, where he's getting all kinds of things right about uh, local customs, um, lo locations. Um, the, the, the shipwreck of St. Paul in and of itself is extremely interesting. He's the only um, historian, um, I think it was... Uh, Ptolemy, that story Ptolemy and somebody else so who, fantastic who, who only gets Cotta right. He's the only person who gets the correct location of the island of Cotta. Uh, Pl Plutonia, Pliny got it wrong. Ptolemy got it wrong. Uh, the author of Acts is the only person who got it right. Um, there are all kinds of, um, and I know you don't like this, but there's all kinds of undesigned coincidences. <laughs> this completely swings free from the synoptic problem um, that because it's from between Paul's letters and Acts, um, and people can check out, there's a uh, video by Lydia McGrew. They can watch for free if they want, uh, called just how wrong can Bart Ehrman be? Cause our Ehrman also says he wasn't a companion of Paul. And she goes through a bunch of undesigned coincidences that show, no, he's absolutely a traveling companion of Paul, which is not even by itself a supernatural claim. It's not, is even she like, looking for the problems with acts or yeah. is she only trying to find oh, ways yeah, to connect Yeah, of course. Them? We, we, I, I, I have several videos where I talk about the discrep alleged discrepancies in the book of Acts that we get. Are there, direct, does she walk away and say they're alleged or does she just, she just says, well, there are no discrepancies really. It's, it's just alleged Lydia ones. Lydia McGrew is not an inerrantist. And so she's going to look at all of these things on a case by case basis and say, uh, I think this is an error. And I think this is an error. The problem is, is that. Does she do that with Acts? Does she actually pick yeah. apart and say, Hey, there's many errors with Acts. And, I don't think and, she's going to say that there's many errors with Acts. I'm not right. even sure if she has an alleged discrepancy with Acts. I know she has several candidates that she uh, talks about in her book with the gospels that she thinks are definitely discrepancies. But the problem with that is that in eyewitness testimony, you expect some discrepancy. The other thing is, is that a, a few discrepancies that aren't like major, I don't see how that's going to, carry the day and overwhelm about a hundred different other evidences that, that I could point to that point in the direction that he was a traveling companion of Paul. Um, yeah. I, I don't, I don't think a few discrepancies can just go just completely turn the boat over like that. I, I think that if the discrepancies are things that you would in fact imagine the actual companion sure. of Paul knowing about Paul and he doesn't sure. get those facts correct, or he doesn't understand certain things where he even goes against the things Paul might be saying, those are things to be, you know, probably questioning and you'll disagree with them. I bet at the end of the day, my hope is that anyone watching this, whether you're on the Christian side or the skeptical side, you approach the data, you do your best to not be like, this is my tribe. And right. if this no, is no, what no. it looks like, if at the end of the day that he was a companion, like if we granted the maximalist approach that these people believe they saw Jesus, all of these things, should we walk away from all this literature and say, you know what, I'm going to just accept everything that Eric says and, and the McGrews say about the Gospels and the New Testament um, 
Therefore, this is literally true. Jesus actually rose from the dead, and I should believe in this. Well, again, it's it's the claims that they're making. And what I'm trying to say is that it, it establishes that it goes back to what the eyewitnesses claim. And then why would they make such a claim in the context of persecution? Um, there is a, a, a guy by the Which name claims? Of, Which claims? The, the claims to the, to the resurrection. The bodily so who, appearances who, of the resurrection. My, my question is, and in light of this, I mean, we have church fathers who were martyrs and stuff that they're saying, they're writing letters saying, I'm going to die on behalf of Christ, yada, yada, yada. Sure. But uh, the only person that I know of who's writing about in the New Testament other than maybe John on the island of Patmos is being persecuted in some way, he claims, but really may have just been exiled because he was a nuisance in the city. There's there's reasons to think maybe he was exiled to get him away from the city. That's better than you know killing somebody who just won't stop talking about something. Kind of like uh, the way that they treated uh, Jesus Ben Ananias, if you want to take that account and Josephus is accurate. This guy's kind of a nutter, and they're like, get him out of here. We don't want him yeah. around. So um, apart from that, the only eyewitness that I know of that's being persecuted and is writing about being persecuted is Paul. That doesn't mean Acts doesn't mention Stephen, or this guy who supposedly dies. Sure, that, this is why I would. This is why I would argue for the the reliability of Acts. I don't think that the right. mailing list is going to make a very good, compelling case for for martyrdom. I think they can make a good case um, for Peter um, because his death is mentioned in John's Gospel, and like, where is that even coming from? Uh, obviously. Paul endured heavy persecution. Um, I think there's the idea in Paul's letters that the churches themselves that he's preaching at are enduring persecution and he's aware of other apostles. And so if they're preaching, if they're saying that they're endorsing his gospel, then there's a good chance that they're probably enduring persecution as well. But I'm not going to sit there and say that that like definitively proves that. I'm just going to say that's probably the inference to the best explanation. Um, but um, what I'm saying is, is like, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think I lost my train of thought again. Going Just, back to one thing real quick, though, um, the, the fact that some people do, I, I know of skeptics who do say that Acts was written by a traveling companion of Paul. They just still don't accept the miraculous part. I have a guy who did a, a, a video response to me, uh, goes by hats off. Some of your um, subscribers may be familiar with him. Smaller channel, really good. Uh, good he, guy knows his scholarship really well. And uh, I've had conversations with him, enjoyable guy. Um, but he thinks that Acts was possibly written early and, and probably written by a traveling companion Paul. He's not sure if it's Luke or not, uh, but he thinks that's possible. So this isn't like a just a conservative Christian thing. No, I, I, I agree. I think maybe there's people on all ends. There's Christians who say that Luke did not was not a companion of Paul. There's atheists who may say they think he was or whatever, and they're still drawing the conclusion. Um, there's like little things that we, when we're building up this case, it, I think that there's like, this tower that we're building of all this information. And it's almost like every little mention, there's something that you'll say. And then something in my mind, I'll be like, well, when it says they're being persecuted, if you're reading people like Paula Fredrickson, if you're reading some of these scholars who talk about Jews and then Gentile conflicts in the first century, how this would have disrupted the social aspect of Gentiles who would have had to be noble to their gods. Cause you're not just disrupting the Gentiles and their sure. communities their sure. understanding of heaven and earth and how the gods would treat the humans and society at large for you neglecting the deities and no longer giving them their worship. So the kind of persecution like uh, that, they'll, that she'll mention Paul may have endured was within like synagogues being slapped, you know, uh, with a stick, you know, by other Jews that are right. out here whipping him. And it's not like the 39 lashes from Mel Gibson. It's like, these are like interdisciplinary things of like, Hey, you need to get tone it down, and, and you, it's not this. Here are well, these these. He's also stoned. Let's not forget that one. <laughs> like, well, he may have been. Yeah, they. At least he claims thrown, to have been. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I get it, and maybe he's getting thrown uh, stones thrown at him for whatever reason. He pissed off some people, but um, I, I just I wouldn't jump to this persecution means everybody's out to kill all these Christians. Well, I'm not necessarily saying that, and everywhere monolithically either what i'm well again i would argue for um a high reliability of the book of acts um i would say that's probably the most historically defensible book in the in the new testament uh, and it gives us so many times so much opportunity for luke to actually fail as a historian and yet over and over again i feel like he passes with flying colors and the only good objections that i hear to uh, against acts are well you know he doesn't agree with paul's theology here i think or he's not familiar with uh paul's doings over here or something like that. Or he's, you know, like, what about this trip to Arabia? Like Luke doesn't even say anything about it or stuff like that. Um, people could go check out my videos if they want to see what I would say in response to that. 
Um, but I don't think that any of those arguments are really that good. Most most of them aren't very good at all. Um, nor can they carry the day and just again sink Acts as, as a historically reliable book when I can go point you to Hammer and he can give you 84 different things that Luke minute details that Luke gets right. I can point you to a book called The Voyage and Shipwreck of St. Paul by James Smith, who was uh, a, uh, a sailor, um, knew that area, and was like, whoever wrote Acts knew what he was talking about, and he was a landsman. Um, mm -hmm. He wasn't a, a sailor. Um, and then I can look at all the different various undesigned coincidences between Paul's letter, Paul's letters. Um, that people can read it, a book called Hori Polonae for free. They can download it. It's written by William Paley. Lydia McGrew has revived his argument in her book, Hidden in Plain View, um, where there's like 40 different undesigned coincidences between the book of Acts and Paul's epistles. And it's like a couple of contradictions that look apparent that are kind of easily reconcilable in an unforced way are not going to carry the day and make me say that, that this is an unreliable book. Yeah, I would I would obviously check out the material that Eric's saying. Go look at Lydia McCrew and also look at anyone if there are any people out there who've taken a skeptical approach to Lydia McGrew um, and see what they have to say about this material. Also investigate other academics who are writing commentaries on this material. I highly recommend people go check out Pervo. I'm going to get to the super chats here in just a second, Eric. Um, check out Pervo. Check out Shelly Matthews. I just started reading her commentary as well. I'm going to be interviewing her soon on Axe. Was Luke Axe a traveling traveling companion of Paul? We're going to get into some of the discrepancies she brings out. Um, look at both ends. Investigate the stuff. For me, I hope that you'll continue to explore these things. They're fun. And people ask, why as an atheist do you give a crap about investigating this? Well, there's 2 billion people, according, you know, just roughly – that will say they're Christians. And I was a Christian. And I think the impact of Christianity is enough to keep someone like me interested in showing the data. Well, I could go do a call-in show specifically. I'm not saying I won't do a call-in show. I plan on doing one at some point. But like, I could specifically just do like all the atheist talking points of being a skeptic in general and go out there and like do that. I'm like stuck down into the minutia here of details and pericopes and, and source material and all that kind of stuff. You don't see it as often. Um, and it's something I love to do. Alan Bird says, how is one saved? Does baptism regenerate? Except, um, just check out Lutheran satire. Um, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, they have a pretty good video where it's like, you ever heard about the thief with the cross and like the guy's in hell and he keeps having a Baptist ask him that question over and over again. Um, and so anyways, uh, I don't think I'm not, I'm not a believer in baptismal regeneration, but I can see some good arguments for it. But to me, it's a it's a um, it's a secondary issue, I guess, um, on my part. Um, it's not like I, I encourage every Christian to be baptized as soon as they make a profession of faith. Do you think um, I've seen you say somewhere you're Pentecostal? Do you think that uh, people who aren't baptized in the Holy Spirit and get the gifts in some way, shape or form, are they, um, are they saved or? Oh yeah, of course. Yeah. No, 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 no Pentecost Trinitarian Pentecostal. I mean, one is Pentecostals, uh, are modalists. They, they mm -hmm. believe that, um, they don't accept the Trinity. They just believe that God wears three hats, father, spirit, and son. Um, and apparently he was talking to himself when he was getting baptized by John the Baptist or something, right. but, um, yeah, they think that you have to speak in tongues to be saved, but no assemblies of God, four square, uh, Church of God, Church of God in Christ, um, or any of the other Pentecostal denominations are going to say that you have to speak in tongues in order to be saved. Okay. Alan Bird, thank you for that. Constellation Pegasus. Derek, give us three books people doubting God should start with. Hmm. I'd like to know what, what kind of faith religion they're coming with, but if they're coming from Abrahamic, one of the books that really helped me, and I'm a little weird, um, it's not like, uh, the, the God delusion and stuff like that. There's some people who like, you know, full on like anti-theistic, uh, material. Um, for me, it was knowing that the ancient Near Eastern deity, Yahweh, El, if you will, they get merged into one, just like Daniel McClellan talks about in, in some of his clips, you mentioned him earlier, uh, is that book Francesca Stavrakopoulou wrote God and Anatomy, which I love right now. And it just shows you the corporeal understanding of God. And it was when philosophy and Hellenism started to kind of 
impact the understanding of the deity, making this God kind of in an unfalsifiable way where divine hiddenness in a sense shows up. Um, because now God is no longer like actively there in, in a corporeal sense with Israel. But for me, it was like when I saw the human elements to that, that helped me out. I keep coming back to that one because I really love that. As far as as far as doubting God goes, um, I took a scientific approach to try and understand like why we believe in gods. There's a book literally called Why We Believe in Gods that I highly recommend uh, reading. And then the recent one that I just read is uh, The God... Um, the illusion of God's presence that I would say is really, really good. And these are just more recent ones that I've come across. So the illusion of God's presence by John Wathy. And in that one, he's talking about the natural phenomena for why someone would want to believe in a God and, and how it comes natural. I mean, you're looking at an agent We're, we are relying on agents our entire life as infants growing up. So assuming agency is going to be there to protect you or be there to guide you or to protect you in some way, feed you, wipe your hiney, the whole nine, it, then it's already drilled into our genetic code for so long. This is how motherhood has been with infants and stuff like that. So it takes that kind of approach, a scientific approach and explaining why people imagine agency just a step beyond the mother um, being divine. So uh, that's my recommendation if you're interested in checking it out. And they're serious. They're not just like out here like, ha, ha, ha. Like it, it, it's, it's like actual academic work. MTN show one, don't think about it. Don't ask questions. Just bend the knee and believe the Jesus baby. Ignorance is hellproof. Did you want to say something about this? Believe? Uh, yeah, you like jazz? Sorry, that was a like B-movie like reference. <laughs> um. Don't I'm nobody's I'm not at all saying don't think about it or don't ask questions. I'm I'm saying think about it rigorously, understand the Christian side first, um, understand what Christians have said in response to a lot of these objections. You you will begin to find different patterns and different things like that. Um, then investigate the uh, what people have said against it. Uh, listen to the Bart Ehrmans, listen to the Paula Friedrichsons, listen to the Dale Allisons. I think they have important things to say, we would ignore them at our peril, but I'm not going to tell somebody um, who is a new believer, run down the store and uh, get Jesus interrupted. No, I'm, I'm not going to do that. That's, that's, that's not a wise thing to do. And I would say to voice that in the opposite approach, I'm not going to say start with your skepticism first. I would say get all this information at once um, because I don't, I'm not interested in trying to make believers or get people convinced because they're reading a particular side. I am biased in this. Uh, I want them to read both sides and investigate and weigh out your options. Um, I, but then again, like if I was a Christian, I would probably say what you just said there, Eric, and say, look, first, at least understand our side first. And I don't have that kind of, um, been to say you need to first understand every argument the McGrews make and my particular understanding of apologetics as it comes to the Christian message and the claims of Christianity, then go and investigate all the skeptics out there. Because at the end of the day, if not too many skeptics have actually investigated that particular version or put too much time and energy into that kind of argumentative case, I would rather you have multiple tools in your tool bag to choose between and go from there. You know sure. Well, yeah, and I wouldn't even say I, I, apologetics isn't just all about reading the other guys, um, but there are some people that I would recommend um, that they check out to, to just better their understanding and, and sharpen themselves. Um, I, I don't think it should ever be about just reading the other guys, um, but I don't think that they should be completely ignored either, and that was never the point of the video that I made. Yeah, and I, I think that you're going to bat for the McGrews, which honestly I don't know a lot about. And I mean, if I'm frank, uh, I I really don't. I really don't know much about them. I haven't read their works. I haven't dove into their case. Uh, I think I've heard in passing that one live stream that you did with Tim and Lydia. And that was it. I mean, yeah. and then the one thing I got was just that Tim was like, you know. Uh, Tim you was know, a little peeved. So oh, I, yeah. That's all I got. So I just got you're listening. You know, I'm I kind of got a bad taste, but yeah. it's like, I know there's more to what they're probably trying to argue and going yeah. into their books. 
but at the end of the day, I, I, I'm like, all right, well, you know, I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, we'll keep going. Constellation Pegasus, not trying to be mean spirited and hurtful. Does Eric think the earth and man is 6,000 years old? Why does Christianity push this still? I, I don't know. I think young earth Christian or young earth creationism comes out of uh, seventh day Adventism. I think inspiring philosophy has a pretty good video um, drawing that particular connection. Uh, I am not a young earth creationist. I don't recommend Christians be a young earth creationist. Um, I don't think that as an atheist, you need to inundate yourself with the arguments for young earth and creationism um, because it, it's just the evidence for it is, it, it's not there, but if you want to have at it, um, if you want to go debunk them, we'd probably be on the same side. Um, yeah. <laughs> Okay. Uh, good question. And thank you for the super chat. Yeah. I think that, uh, that's one of the things I try to do is get people to, to obviously stop thinking in things that are backwards, if that makes sense. Oh yeah. Kip Davis is in the chat. Oh God. Undesigned coincidences. Ugh. yeah. Well, I mean, you know, I just, am trying to line my pockets and, um, be a part of that billion dollar <laughs> industry, Kip. <laughs> Who said you know? that? No, no, no. There's Kip did. You did Kip. You said it was a billion dollar industry. I need the receipts. Oh, on that well, one. see that now. Maybe now, it is. I mean, I think counting, you're saying the Christian, the Christian counting, the whole... counting maybe the dinosaur adventure land in Kentucky, whatever that is, maybe, but that was wild, man. I don't know. <laughs> so, uh, Kip, if you want to, if you want to debunk undesigned coincidences, I would, I would love to see it. Please, please do it. I'm not saying that you can't do it at all. I'm not, this isn't like a mean. Has anyone taken a jab at I'm, it? I'm just, there's a few people that I've seen who have sort of taken a jab at it. And mostly it's like, well, redaction, or it, it's just, it, it's just a lot of fail. And so. Uh, who did, do you know, can you name uh, it? Richard Carrier wrote um, a pretty, I think of several blogs on it. Jonathan McClatchy responded to him. Uh, there's another guy, he goes by. Paul talked about him in his video. I know he's a biblical scholar. He's in England, um, or at least he's studying to be one. He goes by a pseudonym on, uh, he had a medium post about it and it just wasn't very good. Um, and so I'm waiting for a good response to undesigned coincidences. I, most of the stuff that I've seen is just like, Ooh, like. Give not, us an example of one undesigned coincidence. That's a huge one that you, you hear a lot or that helped you in a discrepancy or maybe it's not a discrepancy. discrepancy. Maybe not um, a discrepancy. You probably just... well, one of my favorite ones is uh, yeah. where, where uh, Herod is talking in uh, Matthew chapter 14. And he's um, saying something about asking his servants about Jesus. Like what's going on with this dude. And it's kind of like, you're like, what? Like, how, do, how does Matthew know anything about what Herod is saying to his servants? That seems kind of odd. This is the first few verses of Matthew. Well, then you turn, it just leaves this piece of information that's dangling out there. The Matthew well, if you go 1? To Matthew 14. Oh, Matthew 14. Yeah, okay. Matthew 14. I believe it's 1 through 3. Uh, and then you go through Luke 1, or 8, 1 through 3. Uh, and it talks about that Jesus had a group of female followers, um, one of which was Joanna, the, um, the wife of Husa, who is Herod's household manager. And so then it's like, oh, okay. That explains how Matthew would know like what he's saying, but he never references Luke. He never talks about Luke. He never talks about Joanna being the wife of Husa. And so these both of these little pieces of information just dovetail in a way that is very casual and is very subtle and doesn't seem to be deliberate. Like, okay, let me I, I was pulling that up. I literally apologize for not catching what you were trying what what you were trying to say there because I was pulling up the pericope. I figured we'd go oh, through sure. it together, but sure. But okay. So Sorry, give me your argument. Know. What is the argument again? Okay. So undesigned coincidences is basically like, um, like to give you an example of one in everyday life. Okay. Uh, let's say that um, a, a friend of mine and me, were going to meet at a minor league baseball game mm -hmm. and we're going to discuss like some kind of business deal or something like that. Okay. Um, and um, I'm telling the story about it later and he's telling the story about it later and he talks about how he got beer spilled all over his pants or something like that. And I talk about this guy behind me caught a foul ball. Okay. Well, you know, in minor league, in, in baseball games, major or minors or whatever, uh, people tussle over balls and all that kind of stuff all the times and uh, beverages get spilled and things like that. 
Um, but one, one person just gives you one detail. The other person gives you another detail and they're done in this. It's all subtle. It's all casual. And um, it's not like this design, like in, mm -hmm. and one detail fills in the other detail. So, t okay. I get what you're saying now, as far as the gospels though, that you were just saying about Herod in Matthew, you have this part. What does Matthew say? Then, then go to the, sure. Sorry. Her Herod is asking like, what's the deal with this guy, Jesus? And he's asking his servants. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so how in the world does Matthew know what Herod is saying to his servants? You could just say, well, he's just making it up. He's just, mm -hmm. he's just fudging a story. Um, or, you know, or you could be a Christian and be like, well, maybe the Holy spirit told him, you know, and that's not very satisfying. Okay. Um, and so if you go in a separate account, completely unrelated, has nothing to do with Herod and his servants whatsoever, uh, that conversation, if you go in Luke chapter eight, verse one through three, it talks about the women who are helping finance Jesus's ministry and following him around and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And it talks about one of them's name was Joanna, the wife of Husa, and it mentions that Husa was Herod's household manager. Okay. And so these two unrelated passages just kind of like, Fit together in this very casual and subtle way it's like oh one fills in the other and it, it's not like the result probably of copying okay um, right. i'm not saying that's, copying that's... is completely off the table i'm just saying that it's probably not now one undesigned coincidence by itself it's like big deal so what that could be statistical noise uh, it could be explained in a number of different ways but when you get multiple instances of undesigned coincidences crisscrossing all over the different documents that is when it becomes um, harder to deal with because now you got to explain each one of those one by one by one. And when you do that, that becomes very ad hoc um, because you're having to explain all of these different things when I have one unified theory that explains it all. So um, just tossing this out there because I've not even read this the, the work that you're discussing here. Most academics that I talk to, in fact, I think it's unanimously consensus across the board on almost every scholar, Christian or not Christian, doesn't matter. They all think that Mark is our first gospel and that yeah. Matthew and Luke are using Mark at the least, depending on what kind sure. of hypothesis they hold to after that, whether Luke knew Matthew or Matthew knew Luke, whatever. The point is, is there seems to be crosstalk amongst this literature and that they're using other literature. Like 90% of Mark is in Matthew. Sure. So whoever this author is, is using this. Is it more ad hoc to assume that the author is using their own literary freedom or in some way they're they're writing in the additional details that are different or that in somehow complement the literature they're already aware of that they're copying or is it an undesigned coincidence do you see what i'm trying to get at yeah like, i would say because they're so subtle and so casual and they don't seem to be like ta-da like this is the way that it is and this is what we're doing and i don't think that they're trying to be sneaky because they crisscross all throughout the different documents mm -hmm. repeatedly over and over, it doesn't look like it's deliberate and it doesn't look like it's accidental. Could so it be a coincidence sometimes? Like, like what I'm saying is, yeah, this, well, right. I'm not saying that none not... of them, I'm, I'm not saying that none of them couldn't be coincidences. Okay. And I'm not saying some of them couldn't even be designed, but when you see it over and over and over and over again, in all of these different ways, it builds a cumulative case um, that this is reportage versus the hypothesis that this is, redaction or this is just statistical noise what you don't want to do is you don't want to fall into this black and white thinking that just because matthew and luke use mark that okay well anything that is different from mark that's obviously redaction that's obviously just them taking liberties that's that's just obviously something else or they okay? or they maybe they have another they, source that they're using. yeah I mean, they, they could have they what i'm trying to say is that they have there's dependence and there's independence you don't want to get black and white i'm not saying like it's just everything is completely independent that that's ridiculous okay um we we know about the synoptic problem we well, are I'm aware glad that you accept we've, that <laughs> we've heard about the synoptic problem we're not like what the synoptic problem there goes undesigned coincidences no that's 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 not that's not the argument we're saying that it's partial dependence and partial independence and that is not that weird and, and, and when you go, there's all kinds of undesigned coincidences between the book of Acts and Luke. And if somebody's going to say, well, Luke wasn't a traveling companion to Paul, well, he's not getting these things from looking at Paul's letters. Uh, most of the time, critics are going to say well, he contradicts Paul's letters. So which one is it? Mm -hmm. um, and so and I think those are some of the stronger ones as well. Um, and it, it swings completely free from this whole synoptic problem kind of issue. Okay. 
Uh, appreciate the explanation. I definitely want to dive in myself because that's one of the things I would be first and foremost. We it seems very apparent that there is absolute reliance and dependence on Mark. Period. And sure, some of sure. the scholars, like Goodacre, would say they even think Luke is aware of Matthew. I know some scholars would go, well, sure about that. Matthew yeah. knows Luke." It, my point is, is like they're seeing inner talk. There's talk going on between sure. the literature. But even like Goodacre, who's a non, he's a far hypothesis guy who doesn't think Q exists. Yeah. Uh, not saying that there was another literature because he's come on my show and says, I'm not saying that the, they weren't using some source of something sure, or they were getting their information somewhere in some way, shape or form. But, uh, but he's not convinced of like, you know, recreating the sayings of Jesus. Somehow we can redact and find a way to like recreate all of that. That's his kind of contention. Um, but when I, when I see that reliance and dependence on other literature, I mean, I don't necessarily think if something doesn't show up, let's say Matthew has only immaterial, right? And we go, where'd it come from? It must have come from somewhere before that. We don't know that. We can say that, we can hope that, but um, anything that might look like it connects to other literature in some way, even if it doesn't seem like it's subtle and it doesn't seem like it's forced, um, could just be that they are well aware of the previous material and they are using those freedoms to do it. I'm saying you can't. Yeah. Well, that. when it's when it's little things that are subtle and casual, like the city where Philip is from, for example, mm -hmm. um, you know, that that's one of the other undesigned coincidences. And so, I mean, is, is that really something that's just so strong in the, the oral tradition or some, maybe. some, some unnamed super gospel that we don't know about. I mean, again, that's maybe, you know, and it's kind of yeah. like if, if and it if, could be maybe if, your way, but it's, a well, maybe. it's no, well, I don't think it's, I think the probability is more on my side when you have a bunch of these different things that certainly look like this way. And you, when you have to explain it one by one by maybe kind of, and it's just improbable. Well, that's just kind of like, say for example, and maybe people won't like this illustration, but I've, I've, use this before. If, if I have the symptoms of COVID, okay, um, I have a fever and, uh, you know, I'm having short breath and um, I have this dry cough and whatever else, okay, I could try and explain all of those symptoms and because I really don't want COVID. It's like, well, you know, I was uh, at the football game the other day and I was raising my voice and well, you know, I just mowed the yard and it's hot. And I mean, even though that was three hours ago, maybe I just haven't cooled off yet. And, you know, and I could come up with all these different ways to, to say, well, I can kind of explain this symptom and this symptom, but there's one unified hypothesis that would explain all the symptoms that I'm having, even if I don't like that hypothesis. Does that make sense? No, I get what you're saying. I, I think that there could be a unified understanding of their reliant on each other. And uh, th there is the freedom. I'll give you an example. What were the name of the wise men who brought gifts to Jesus? They're not named. They're not named. The early church fathers named him. Very early on, they give three names to the three kings because they weren't really three kings in the text. They brought three gifts. They thought three kings. They gave them traditional names. Now, where did they get that material from? Did they find that material from some source? Maybe, but we don't know. I think that they may have created the tradition of adding in the names. We don't know. All I'm saying is we can't prove one way or the other of whether or not they got this from some oral tradition, they got this from a different source of some tradition that may have been written somewhere, or they had the liberty as authors to create this. And if you take the Robin Faith Walsh approach that I've been talking about, this is literature and it's competitive type of literature writing this type of genre. Right, right. But when when it's fiction, it doesn't interlock in subtle, casual ways. That's the problem. When it's fiction, what do you mean? When when you, when it's when it's redaction when it's made up when they're just making stuff up it doesn't interlock usually and it maybe once or twice it could interlock but it doesn't interlock in the kind of fashion that i'm talking about over and over and over so well, what there's I, also I, probably places where they don't interlock and there's scholars who point out that sure. they don't agree and they don't line up and they're purposely changing things like matthew changes mark and i just did a video with james tabor on this where he like picks apart mark i mean there's subtle differences that also change the game big. Like when Jesus gets baptized, it says that God speaks and says, you are my son and you, I am well pleased. Greek specific only to Jesus. Matthew comes on and he's like, this is my son. Because in, in Mark, he's the secret Messiah. He's Shh, go and tell no one. Father, I thank you. You did not reveal these things to them. I speak in parables so people don't understand. 
Then you get to another gospel and it does something completely different. And while we can look for those little subtle, you know, um, designed or undesigned coincidences, however we want to like view this, there are other positions that make sense. So like, I would, I would just be like, all right, I need to look in this undesigned coincidence thing, yeah. see the pericope. I'd also want to bring this to other academics who are like synoptic scholars, like Goodacre, uh, other people like that, and say, do you think there's something to this, or do you do you have any potential better alternative explanation that fits this kind of ex what they're trying to argue, and then see what they have to say. What do you say to that? You think that's a good idea? Yeah, I would love for them to interact more. I, I'm I'm waiting for better interaction with this argument than what I've seen so far because what I've seen some from it so far is just like that's old you know whatever or don't you know about the synoptic problem Eric you big dumb bunny you know <laughs> and it's just like okay like yes we're aware of the synoptic problem and so I would love to see them interact with it I would love to see them like actually slow down read her book um one of the habits that I would warn people against is don't go well you know this is kind of a weaker example and I'm not buying it. And so I'm just going to throw out the entire thing. Don't do that. Okay. It's a cumulative argument. Um, I don't necessarily think that every single example that um, uh, JJ Blunt gives or, or Lydia McGrew gives is the best example, but there are a lot of good examples that are, I think are very, very difficult to explain away. Uh, going back to your point about, you know, yeah, Matthew could have said this and that for literary purposes or just different things like that. Or maybe Matthew's just telling the story in his own words. And I think one bad habit of New Testament scholars is their preference for complex over simpler theories and failure to recognize that sometimes a variation is just variation. It's not just because he's like, let me say it in this very deep theological way to like really drive the point home. I'm not saying that's impossible. But sometimes just variation is variation. Just like you could hear two different stories of eyewitness testimony and somebody might get the details a little bit different and say something in a different way. And it doesn't necessarily mean that like well, the, you main, talk about the main thrust of it is- but You talk right. about cumulative case. And so taking this cumulative case, if we approach Matthew, just Matthew and Mark, and we just set those two gospels aside, the 12 look like Dumbos in Mark. They don't get it. The one time anyone comes close- Paul or Peter says, you're the son of God. Flesh and blood did not reveal this to you. You're lucky, okay? This is my father in heaven that actually reveals this. But in Matthew, they get it. And they get it over and over and over. And like, this isn't like- Do they not know? A, <laughs> yeah, no, they get it. They get it. And you can see the change in the pericope. I'm you not line it up side by side and you'll see the differences start to roll out. And you're like, okay, like, why is Matthew- making the disciples look better than they look in Mark. Well, I would like, I'd be interested to see, you said that was with, uh, what was the guy you were talking about? So um, James Tabor, Tabor. Right? Yeah, 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 I'm did, familiar with who Tabor is. I'll I, check well, it out. It's, this is something that, it's not just even Tabor, it's like, no, no, I know, Tabor, I know like lots of people, of lots of people say this, lots of people say this. Um, I'm yeah, not, but I'm not I, saying that they're, they're I'm not even saying all of it's wrong. Um, I'm just saying there, there's, Sorry, to, I would investigate that. Sorry like keep, you want me to invest the undesigned coincidence. Sure. Yeah. You know I what mean, I mean? Hey, tr trade, trade. You know, I can't okay. shake on it, but shake. Um, shake <laughs> yeah. Shake there we go. Yeah. There I go. I'm all the way over here. Anyway. All right. All um, right. Check out. Yeah. Go ahead. Let's. let's so go. I got. Wow. I got to give. He's he's wanting indulgences here, Eric. So we sell yeah. those here. I know that we're the false church of of you know myth vision, as you would think, but I think we're really the true church. Um. Constellation Pegasus, I find it amazing how God never warned the Jews about the devil, the wannabe murderer of all mankind. You go from a loyal prosecuting angel and angels that can't rebel. Christianity goes from polar opposite later. Yeah, Houston, we have a problem. Or I mean, we've what, got a problem. What, what's going on with Job? I, like, what, what's happening The there? wannabe murderer of all well, mankind. What about Genesis chapter 3? Um, what, what's going so on you, there? This, the serpent? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I mean, maybe people want to make that out as separate characters and they're going to have their different hypotheses. I'm not an Old Testament person. I don't spend enough time in the Old Testament like I should. It is an area that I should get more involved in. Um, that's one thing I, I do appreciate about Kip is like that's and, and Josh um, is that's where they spend their time. And I think uh, Christians should spend more time talking about those things and they leave a lot of the things that they say uh, unaddressed. And um that's an area where I would like to learn more about, but 
I, I guess I don't really see a huge disunity or incongruity there. Um, that is a generous super chat. Yeah, so. it is. You better give him more than that. That's not enough. <laughs> yeah, I feel like um, I gotta earn this. I should look, get up look, and dance. So, or so we there there is a lot of academics who talk about this kind of evolution that's happening in Second Temple Judaism. Sure. Um, even like Enoch is kind of narrating things that it's like almost like uh, commentator commentaries filling in the gaps, but giving more of a elaborate narrative explaining probably after their Persian influence, where you have kind of a dualistic world where um, Satan takes on this enemy role that he didn't quite, even though he fits a description you could put him in, he was really God's pit bull, so to speak. He did everything on behalf of God. Um, it almost seems like later he's this rebellious uh, figure that like is fighting against God rather than working for God, if that makes right. sense. Right. And so this is something that a lot of scholars see throughout the Hebrew Bible is like there's this development. In fact, we got Kip Davis in the chat. He added me. Why does Eric think that scholars have largely ignored un, undersigned, I think it means undesigned coincidence? He got auto, he got auto corrected there. Um, I don't think a lot of them are aware of it. I mean, like I said, when Derek, you talked about it with Dale Allison, he had no idea what they were. If you watch the debate between Tim McGrew and Bart Ehrman, I, in my opinion, Bart came completely unprepared. He didn't really know what he was talking about. You can watch that debate and form your own opinion if you like. Um, and so I think it's an older argument that maybe fell out of fashion, but that doesn't necessarily make it wrong. Um, and so I, I just honestly don't think many of them are aware of it. I would love for them to become more aware of it. I would love for them to come up with counter explanations and argue against it. I would love to see how the McGrews would respond to something like that. Um, I, I think they would love more interaction on this particular topic because most of the interaction that I've seen so far is just very, very weak based on straw men, uh, based on a lack of um, any any kind of historical imagination whatsoever. It's just this black and white thing. And um, don't you know about the synoptic problem and blah, blah, blah. And it's where obviously it's redaction and maybe it was just dumb luck or they they really, there was a super gospel and, and why, why can't that be uh, an explanation? And I, I don't think any of those arguments are very compelling. I'd, I'd like to see something better. Okay. Uh, Kip says also there is no Satan or angelic rebellion in Genesis three. Yeah. Again, I'm not an old Testament guy, so I, I wouldn't be able to answer this question to um, people's satisfaction probably. And that's, that's just where I'm at. That's something that I would like to learn more about. Um, I think it's kind of like what we talked about when I was saying how the, the new Testament would, or Christians kind of interpreted, they, they, they have like a mystical approach to the scriptures and found ways to, uh, insert, I'll use the term, the ideas that they may have in this late Second Temple period um, sure. or right there at the destruction of the Second Temple period where they're they're seeing, oh, that dragon, you know, that, that serpent of old, uh, that's, that's Satan, you know, and try to posit that Genesis 3 is somehow Satan or something. And Well, I would just like to know the alternative. Maybe Kip can answer in the chat who he, he can. Being. I'm sure he, I'm sure he can. I'm sure he's yeah. got, thought about it a lot. Yeah, and and this is why I say like when someone asked me like if you're doubting like what books should you read if you're specifically dealing with Abrahamic ones is getting into the ancient Near Eastern literature of the Bible and like recognizing God in the context of other ancient Near Eastern gods. Sure. And seeing how that evolution takes place over time and. That's it's even with the Genesis account, like what really was the original context meaning in its response to the Mesopotamian literature in which it seems like it's demythologizing a lot of this literature that it's borrowing its ideas from. Uh, I, I know that even um, even Michael Jones, right? He's done a video where he's like, well, I don't think there's genetic, but he's not denying there's any uh, influence where the narratives sure. of the Mesopotamian stories sure. have come down and the demythologizing and stuff. So I would um, obviously say what the text is saying in the Hebrew Bible versus what Christians later want to say the text is saying, like church fathers and such, are completely different things, or even what the New Testament says. Jones might know more about that than me because he studied that out. I'd love for him and Kip to get together and talk some time if they'd be willing to do that. Um, I know Heiser is somebody who's spent a lot of time looking at Old Testament stuff that I did you say you have him had him on your channel before? Yeah, yeah. I've had him on. Yeah, yeah, we talked about the um, demons. Uh, we went oh, into okay. demons and, sure. and specifically like how 
Azazel and like the the sacrifice you sending out the scapegoat into the wilderness where one of the demons or the lower gods if you will dwells and takes the sacrifice of the sins of Israel and it's just kind of his book was wild yeah and the reason why it's wild is is like this is what the biblical literature is saying that what made it wild to me is I'm reading this right as an unbeliever now and I'm realizing Heiser actually believes what he's writing here is true so like he thinks there really are sons of God who came down and had sex with women and well, produced yeah, Nephilim sure. and all that. He yeah. literally believes yeah. that all of that stuff is true. And I was yeah. like, oh wow. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I'm, I, I don't know if I'd go that far. So, um, yeah, I don't know. Um, it's not an area where I've looked at. I, I have books on my wish list um, that I would like to read. Uh, I'm sure I'm on both sides. Uh, Hoffmeyer. Um, kitchen um are some on my side um if people want to recommend me books on the other side i'd, I'd be had happy to add them to my library as well uh ronald handel if you're going into genesis um uh hold on sorry oh you're fine yeah this is another one here that he does on like how old is the hebrew bible mm -hmm. and so he's taking a critical approach there which is actually kind of conservative to some of the academics but the other one is this one reading genesis and um this is by ronald hindle 10 methods so he goes to show you a lot of interesting material in here i this this one was a fun read um okay hold on <laughs> let me uh, we got a super chat constellation bought salvation for somebody else now with this amount of money thank you uh, Eric, were you aware the Hebrews say the serpent acted on his own accord and Satan was only doing what God told him to do? God started the job, the Job nonsense. How can you not know this? You only know one side of the story. Basics. Boom. Roasted. Drop the mic. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, there's other ways of looking at it, and I'm not going to get into the book of Job. I'm sorry, Constellation Pegasus. I know you're a big spender. Um of course, I understand that there was like a divine counsel. He asked for permission. Uh, God gave him permission. Um, he seems like he says to the effect that he set his crosshairs on Job when he comes up to. There's there's different ways you could read the Hebrew language. And I could be wrong about this, and Kip can correct me, but it's basically God's basically saying, I see that you've set your crosshairs on Job. He gives him the permission. And you, I guess you could look at God as the bad guy there. I don't know. There's different ways of looking at it. And so... Um, yeah, I don't know. Dropping the facts. Pre appreciate the super chat. Uh, another one constellation. Eric needs to read Tovia Singer's book. You did I, put him on the thumbnail. I enjoy Tovia. I want to start responding to his stuff. I, he's one of those guys that I look at and go, I got his wrong, books wrong, 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 wrong. But he's got a lot of interesting arguments. He knows the literature extremely well. Um, I I enjoy him like I enjoy listening to Bart Ehrman. Um, Got to get so, your volumes, man. Yeah. So no, I would I would I would love to interact more with Tobias Singer. People are constantly asking me, can you respond to Tobias Singer stuff? So I would say look to see me interact more with Tobias Singer's. Well, he triggers Christians and atheists, and the reason does, why yeah. well they don't like me because I was well, a lot of them don't like me because I'm I'm interviewing a guy that I'm not picking apart while yeah. i'm interviewing him and see how you and me are having conversations and stuff um like i do plenty of channels going into the hebrew bible showing the ancient Near eastern context and like being very critical in fact i've got dr kip davis in the chat for example like but uh it's also a very sensitive area to get into as well with people who are anti-semitic that show up inside of my chat a lot yeah. I'm also yeah. an ex-Christian, so I can jab at Christians and feel totally in my zone. But there is another aspect in which it's like, yeah, I don't think Mishnah, the Mishnah, the Talmud, the I don't think rabbinic Judaism is true either. Like, I don't think Islam, rabbinic Judaism, I think it's false. I don't think it's true, just like I don't think Christianity is true. Sure. I think that people really do believe that they experienced something or saw something, that kind of stuff. But Apart from that, I just don't I don't draw the ontological conclusions. Well, sure. I mean, I could have a Muslim on my channel and we could talk arguments about the existence of God. You know, it's same kind of thing. But yeah. we would sharply part ways after that. I'm sure that 
I'm sure. Yeah. So I get a lot of people who get pissed off at me, dude, because it's like you're interviewing Rabbi Toby a singer. You need to debunk him. And it's like, bro, I've already told you if I don't want him to ever come back on, I would do that. I'm also a friend of. Right. So it's like yeah, he, he like knows like he knows that I don't believe he knows that I don't believe his religion's true. But I also pick him to come on and be jabbing at Christianity and like, this is a double standard. I can't believe you did this. And it's like, I I was fine going on Apology Alive's channel and talking about minimal facts and why I don't think that it works. Um, And so I I think we should, if if people want to accuse me of saying I'm circling the wagons completely, then why am I going on an atheist channel and saying, hey guys, this is a bad argument for the resurrection and press them on this because they're not listening to me. Mm. Maybe if you guys said it, they'll listen to you and, and, and come up with a better response. So, right, right, right. Yeah. I, I, I do appreciate you jumping on last, um, second here to come on. Sure. I just got back in at 3 AM this morning from interviewing with, uh, with, uh, Francesca, uh, sorry, Francesca, dude, I, sorry, Paula Fredrickson. Um, I have a lot of content to edit. I also did yep. a few interviews with Aaron Adair while I was there. Uh, he's a guy who wrote on the star of Bethlehem, taking a scientific approach um, to the whole star scene and the birth narrative. And it goes in and it's, it's obviously a critical examination of that event. So um, ch- just stay tuned, man. And look, uh, any of this content, send me um, if there's something in specific I should examine and look at. I will get into my arsenal. My arsenal is the Lamb's Book of Life, which is the list of academics that I have in my little apocalyptic intro, and say, hey, is there anyone in here who specializes in this area? Can you take an approach? Now, I'm not so sure they're going to take too much of their time to go read an entire book. Um, Maybe. Well, there's YouTube channels. There's lectures. I mean, the McGrews have tons of stuff on YouTube and they, they give away their resurrection article on their website that's in the Blackwell Companion, which is normally like, I think, a 40 to $70 book. So if people want to avail themselves to the literature, it's absolutely easily accessible and, and available if you have an internet connection. So yeah, have them. I, I'd, I'd love to see more people interact with the Maximal Caves. Yeah. Yeah. And I just, I uh, haven't looked into it enough to really, you know, give too much thought to being critical. But of course, I must admit up front, I'm going to approach it critical like I do everything <laughs> else. I mean, awesome. I, this is my slant. My slant is are there holes? Is there a hole? Um, and the different approach would be you'd go, is there any validity to this being like, did they get this accurate? Did they get this right? I'm going to look, did they get this not accurate? Did they f- get this false? Did they mistake this information? And like, we're both approaching this two totally different angles. Um, and that's why I felt like you would probably approach Islam with me. I'm not saying we wouldn't try to like understand, but you would approach Islam with me poking holes, I suspect, and not. Sure. I, again, I think, I mean, I think that the, the, the if you want to make the contrast between Christianity and Islam and, and compare and contrast, I would say, bring it on. I would say the contrast cannot be possibly starker. Um, I would say that the evidence for Christianity is way stronger than there is for Islam. Um, I would think that you would expect me to say that, um, but yeah. I would I would welcome that comparison. Um, and so, and again, what do you say? What do you say to people who go, look, the Quran goes like right back up to the guy, practically. I mean, well, so so what? What what exactly? He, he's the, the the guy is is using sources, and we we know he's probably using the Gospel of, mm-hmm. of Barnabas for the crucifixion stuff. He's See, saying that, you're being that, honest. That, that Mary Mary is is part of the Trinity and different things like that. It's it's. I'm having a live stream on it tomorrow with a, uh, another guy, uh, Reasoned Answers. He's got a channel, and we're going to talk about it. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think I think if people take the challenge that I'm giving, uh, and they're Muslim. There's going to be more Nabil Qureshi kind of people that come out of that because that's what he what he did. Mm. Um, and so I, I so I, I'm, wanna, I'm, I'm saying welcome. Go for it. Bring it. Yeah, I, I so want to like dive into this. I want to see what you bring up that is supposed evidence for Christianity that is better than like what the Muslims are trying to claim for theirs. Well, there's a miracle claim, first of all. And so that gives us a prima facie reason to actually investigate it. If it can't be easily brushed aside, if it's a miracle claim that's reported at a great distance away 
If it's a miracle claim that is reported uh, way, way, way later than the purported events, it's a, if it's a miracle claim that completely fits with the, the biases of, of the group, and, and um, if it's not a vague report, I'm not saying you have to believe it. I'm just saying if that's the report and it's not some vague thing that there's actual details to investigate, then it's time to roll up our sleeves and actually investigate the details considering the claims that the, the miracle purports to, to be a sign of. Um, Muslims do not have that. The only thing that, again, Muhammad's just like, I'm a warner. People are bugging him all the time. Do a miracle, bro. Prove it. Pro prove that you're a prophet. He says, I'm just a warner. The only thing he says is, make a sir like mine. And it's just like, okay, well, like, he's just basically saying, come rap battle with me. Let's dro drop the bars. And I'm sorry, like, that's just not a very testable hypothesis where I'm saying that this is a more historically verifiable or yeah, unverifiable claim. Um, and so I could really care less. Now, I know there's miracles attributed to Muhammad, but those fail to pass the particular test that I dropped at the beginning because they're in the Hadith and they're long after the reported events. Um, and they're not things that they're, they're long after the event. So just prima facie, it's like, I'm not going to go herring after that particular miracle claim because there's, there's already good reasons to be skeptical to begin with. Yeah. So, and I, I, yeah, no, I get what you're saying. And I'm, I'm with you on an Islam. I, I feel like we have a similar issue in the new Testament in some, uh, not in an identical way, but we have a similar issue in sure. my opinion. So your, your, your argument could be that the, the, they were dated late and they're not eyewitnesses and they're embellished and that it's a really, somebody saw something early enough, but it's a vague report. Um, and that's exactly how I would argue if I was a skeptic and you know, there's problems in the accounts and there's alleged contradictions and all of these different things. And so therefore, uh, we can't really trust what those texts say. All we have is Paul. And all Paul gives us is people saw something or believe they saw something. And that's not enough to warrant giving your entire life to be a Christian. I would agree with you on that. Um, but I don't think that's what Christians are at all left with um, and that they need to learn what, what you know, the arguments for the reliability of the Gospels. Uh, and then they could at least make the argument that that's what those eyewitnesses claimed. And why would they make those claims under the circumstances that they made him? Um, and that would be evidence for a miracle. Um, and other explanations um, are just less plausible, uh, in my, what I would argue. But um, that's where the real meat of the argument yeah, should be. Yeah, that's where we're going to have our differences. Yeah, I, I appreciate you spelling out. And you, you pretty closely still manned me there um, in terms of what I would do and how I would approach this. Because I don't, I don't. Yeah, I don't take the same path you do. Uh, Constellation Pegasus, I'm not trying to be mean, insulting person, but it makes no sense the Jews weren't aware of the devil. Again, I don't know. I, I just what, what follows from that, that, that Jesus didn't raise from the dead? I mean, maybe he just had a, there was more revelation that was given later about the devil. Um, maybe his understanding of the Old Testament is wrong. Um, maybe my understanding of the Old Testament is wrong. Um, but I don't see what really follows from this. This, this is one of those things there are different kinds of objections. And to me, this would be kind of an objection where it's just like, I don't exactly know what to do with that. Um, but it, it's so on the tertiary, the outside of things where the heart of what I'm talking about is what are the miracles? What was actually claimed? Who claimed it? And were they willing to suffer for it? Okay. That's what I really care about. These other things about a, lit a literal Satan or this, that, or the other, and it wasn't in the old Testament. It, maybe it was this idea that developed. Um, okay, I, I don't know. There's maybe multiple different ways to explain that that still wouldn't falsify Christianity, uh, even if it was like I didn't even take Satan as being a literal figure. Now, I, I do think he is. Um, I, I just don't see this as a, as a central concern of mine. Okay, Constellation, I really appreciate that. As far as Satan or uh, the devil goes, oh, that's a good question. Um, the term for the devil and, and this whole idea, I, I would say somewhere in late Second Temple Judaism, I would, maybe this is where this stuff starts to show up. Um, doesn't shock me. I Maybe ask Dr. Kip, actually. He is in the Dead Sea Scroll area, so he might be aware of some literature around this time where the devil pops his head up. Um, or the devil went down in Georgia, you know, you know. Uh, Daniel Whitaker, just to, just to get you while I have you here, um, Myth Vision Podcast in the Bible, does Satan, devil, Lucifer... What is this? We always interact with us as a physical being or a spiritual being. 
I, I don't think it's uh, either or. In fact, this is one of my issues that I've brought up about mythicism in the past is um, the archons of this age or the, the aeons, if you will, the, the, the powers that be, right? It's either human powers or demonic powers, either or. And in like when I read Elaine Pagel's book on the origin of Satan, she points that it's usually both. Like the way that it is, is like a, a certain group of Christians, let's say they demonized, demonized the docetics. The docetists are completely wrong. So they're filled with Satan and their teachings are of the devil and blah, 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 blah. And they are convinced, if you will, that those people are in field and are working for the evil God or the evil, you know, demonic forces that be, or they're controlled by those forces. So it's not either or it's kind of a both. And, and we see this picture, even in one of the gospels where like Judas is a Satan enters Judas. Then he goes to do the deed. So, um, this is one of the reasons I'm like, okay, hold on. I wouldn't always say that like being crucified by the archons means demons. And therefore where did the demons crucify him in heaven? That's a whole nother conversation we can get into, but uh, yeah, I think you and me agree on that. <laughs> um, all right. I, I just want to say, uh, yeah, go check out the interview today with Gnostic informant and uh, Kip. I had to jump on and do a live stream Um because I just got back from uh, the trip and wanted to touch base with everybody. Let me give you guys a plug here. If you're wanting some uh, content by Eric and you want to see what he's doing, even if you disagree, go drop him an algorithmic chat in the comment section. Try to be respectful, okay? I mean, I always want people to try and be respectful. You can disagree and think that he's wrong to the cows fly, and that's fine. But be respectful, if you want to engage with some of his material, you think he's wrong about something, go for it. You know, uh, I, I also hope that if Christians watching this think that we're wrong, challenge yourself, go in here and, and watch the content and, you know, uh, go and challenge that. So this is the latest one. It, this is the re most recent video you did, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. That's one we were discussing. Got it. I just one where I told people to ignore you, Derek. Listen, you want to see how cool I am? Look at this. You ready? Look. I liked the dang video. Oh, shoot. Dang it. Okay. I didn't see the dislike. That's the there. kind of guy I am. Okay. That's right. I disagree, but it's like, you know what? He threw me on the thumbnail and he was, you were prompted by Caleb. Throw his name up there. Screw it. But you didn't <laughs> mention me in the video. I was thinking, why didn't he say my name? Man? No, Maybe I only mentioned a couple. You were sitting on the fence with me. You're like, well, you know, uh, he does bring scholarship, but I disagree with their conclusions. This yeah, is the I, video. yeah, I would not. Um, yeah, I, I anyway, <laughs> I didn't I didn't I didn't pick on you because I thought, well, um, you are bringing a, str a much more intellectually rigorous than some of the stuff that you see. OK, and um, not not everybody that I put on here is not bringing that either. I'm not saying that at all. Um, a lot of these guys uh, do bring uh, a lot of good arguments or like from. Ermin and others and different things like that. I know Apologia has had Ermin on many times. I think he's talked to Allison. Um, and so I'm not at all saying like, I'm just saying you, out of the sheer volume of scholars that you have, it just way outpaces those guys. And it's just because it's the nature of your channel. It's not because they're doing something wrong. They're just doing something different. Yeah. Each to each their own. I mean, I have a different approach and I feel like, uh, to me, that's a good, you know, it's a good thing for me. I'm, yeah. I'd rather hear what the academics have to say about stuff. And then I do involve myself polemically at times yeah. uh, to do that. I do want people to know they can support us here at MythVision, uh, Patreon. I share, you know, any live streams, I'll let you know a little bit in advance. If I even know I'm going to do it in advance. If it's not in advance and it's last minute, I still drop it to let you know. But I did the interviews with Paula Fredrickson. I will be editing those and I'll be dripping them onto Patreon as I get them done. I also have one with Aaron Adair. I have a bunch with James Tabor. I have two courses that I need to edit one with James Tabor on the gospel of Mark. What does Mark say? And like, we go through the entire gospel of Mark in uh, seven lectures. Then I also did one with Delcy Allison Jr. on the quest for the historical Jesus. You will really want to watch that one. Cause it's fun to see how Protestants um, actually through their criticism of Roman Catholicism started using that same scalpel to the text of the new Testament. And like what was reliable and what wasn't, you go through different historical 
uh, scholars through history all the way leading up to Dominic Cross and John Dominic Cross and today on the historical Jesus. So join our Patreon. And we also have a course. If you're wanting to see the ancient Greek mysteries with M. David Litwa, where you kind of get to see the surrounding mystery religions or cults. Um, and then he compares them in the end to Christianity. So if you haven't watched that, the early bird special is still available. And he goes in at the end to talk about all the mystery language that is inside of the Gospels and the New Testament, uh, Paul and such. And then, you know, is there something we can compare Jesus to other gods? He explains to you how there is no zeitgeist here. There's no like, oh, here's the exact Xerox or we got a copy. But is there something to be said about Christianity in its earliest forms with Paul, especially since he's going to Gentiles who would have been aware of mystery cults? using language like this. So you're going to want to watch the course. If you haven't go check it out. It has lots of information in there too, to help educate you with extra reading recommendations. Uh, it helps out Dr. Litwa as well. And then uh, final words from you, Eric, I think, uh, I think we, we had a fun conversation and we, we just disagree. You know, we just, we just aren't on the same page. Yeah. Um, no, just thanks for having me on. Thanks for um, allowing me to, kind of give my side and um, a lot of atheists probably would have just taken my video and made it out to me saying things that I didn't say. And rather than doing that, you invited me on and actually try to understand everything in my own words, because there's only so much you can say in five minutes and it's easy to construe as a short video. Um, it's easy to get misconstrued in that kind of thing. And so uh, <laughs> thanks for show that. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. For, yeah. <laughs> so thanks for trying to uh, understand that. Cause not everybody would do that. Um, and I, I definitely appreciate it. And yeah, uh, I, tr I try to understand it. I mean, even, even though I do think there's kind of like this, uh, there's more motivating behind it and that's to be expected if you're a Christian. So it's like, you don't want to see people fall away, especially if you believe this is true. And you want to encourage people to be in the truth that you believe is true. You don't want to encourage them to go out there and just investigate anything. And being someone who's no longer a Christian who doesn't believe it, I want them to see both sides equally. But sure. you might go, well, I get it. And I understand why you're saying what you're saying. Sure. Uh, Ger Streams made the point. He's like, uh, what did he say? He said, I watched Testify's video just the other day. No shade at him, but it made me chuckle. And I think that the initial response from a skeptic or people who aren't Christian when they hear it is this is kind of like putting out the fire with a fire. Like, let me try and put out some fire here in a well, way. I think that someone the, would receive it. I like think that. that the internet, and this is one last thing that I'll say, and I can let you go. Cause I know you were obviously out late and everything else. And I probably yeah, I was my family's probably like, I'm wondering if I got kidnapped or something, but, um, <laughs> Um, but anyways, uh, I would say that the internet is a good thing and the internet is kind of a bad thing because there's, because of the interest in this particular topic, it can be completely overwhelming, um, to, to and it's like, it's not, it, it's almost like you could just be paralyzed by analysis because of the overwhelming amount of information that's constantly being pumped out on this topic. And let's just be honest. There are some big Christian apologetics channels. Mm -hmm. Um, but the big channels are more on your guys' side to at least some degree. Um, I don't think anybody's touching cosmic skeptic or rationality rules levels of subscribers, um, or, uh, genetically modified skeptic level of subscribers on, on our, our side, David Wood deleted his channel. That was the closest that we had. Mike Winger, I think. Mike Winger. Yeah. And, and even then, um, not everybody's even a, a lot of these channels that have really grown, are doing like cultural apologetics or right. they're, they're trying to counter the, the wrong beliefs of, of, of other Christians or stuff like that. Or they're giving pastoral kind of advice like Mike Winger does. He does other stuff. Um, but not, there's not a lot of people doing the historical side of things. And so, um, so yeah, I, I just think that there's so much stuff out there. All I'm trying to say is like, don't overwhelm yourself. Like, even if you are going to watch these other channels, like, can you slow down and just take one video at a time and really pick it apart one way or the other? What I often run, would run into is people that are just like, well, I saw this video and this video and this video and this video and this video. And it's like, dude, like, why are you not just handling one thing that's troubling you at, at, at the time? Why are you completely just information overloading yourself? 
um, where you don't even know to start to to even understand what you believe in the first place. Um, so that that's that's the bulk of it. Okay. Well, I appreciate you coming on and giving your side. I felt like I was in an empty room about halfway through the video. I'm like, I don't want to misunderstand what he's trying to say at this point because I feel like I'm we're going to talk past each other. And we did talk past each other a lot during this episode, but like at least we had a conversation. And so I yeah. hope more people will practice that and um, look forward to seeing more stuff. Uh, Pine Creek's taking jabs at Caleb's videos and stuff or the other guy's videos and so yeah, there's a lot of fun going on, a lot of drama that's going on, you know, with these ideas. You gotta ideas. just keep riding the drama. We need we need William Lane Craig to say something else again to get everybody riled up. Come again. on. What if he does <laughs> what if he comes kidding, out with uh uh <laughs> what if he says something like uh I'm walking on that bar or something, some epistemic jab at just the bar is on the floor, baby. I I'd I'd laugh. I, he's not going to, of course. No, right? no, he's not. But yeah, I, I really do appreciate you. I hope everybody is having a wonderful day. Um, stay warm if you're in a place that's starting to get cold, like where I'm at, and stay safe. And uh, keep examining, keep investigating, keep your sanity. I think that's what Eric's ultimately is trying to say is keep your sanity and like don't overwhelm yourself. I don't care what position you're in. If you're deconverting and you're actually on the path of deconverting, it can be overwhelming. And so I would say... Take it easy, take it slow, find a hobby that can distract you from this as well, that can keep you from being overwhelmed. And I don't care if you're starting to be convinced or not being convinced, it, whatever path it is, I have said this before, if what you're believing is harming you, causing you issues in your life, and it's not working out, figure out something that'll help you. And that's my encouragement. So uh, Eric, thanks a lot, man. I really appreciate it. Did I say anything else? Did I need to cover anything else for you? Yeah. Well, I'm with Kip. I'm I'm ready for hockey season. Go Blues. <laughs> um, but I'm blacked out in Iowa. I can't watch them, even if I pay for the service, which really sucks. So, but yeah, get a hobby. It's uh, <laughs> you kind of need to be able to. Uh, I think David Hume said he'd go shoot pool and stuff like that. So, um, yeah. Thanks again, man. I really appreciate thanks, you man. letting me say my piece and uh, you're. Um, one of the good ones. Well, thank you, Eric. Appreciate you coming on. We'll be having more of these, I'm sure, as time goes by. Send me what you got. And never forget, we are MythVision.